Hello everybody and welcome back. It is Monday, January 23rd, 2022, and you're listening to episode 155 of the Can I Say Something podcast. Your host, Anna Recluse, with a juicy caboose, Damien. Joining me today is... Derek McDuff. On today's show, in honor of the new year, we'll be counting down our top 10 most anticipated nerdy projects coming out in the year of our Lord 2023. But first, we'll be discussing what we've been watching, including All Quiet on the Western Front, HBO The Last of Us, Avatar The Way of Water, and much, much more. Right into the show, can I say something podcast at gmail.com. Bicycle on Twitter, subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Spotify, rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Tell a friend, family member, or stranger. What's up, man? How are we doing? Doing well. Uh, life is good. Uh, yeah, things are going well. Yeah, brand new year. Um, yeah. Was just was just listening to uh, Sean, Amanda, and Chris doing their um, movie drafts for the year for 2023. I always enjoy their their, their banter. Their <laughs> made up. <laughs> They're made up animosity towards each other. It's like, what the fuck would you pick that? Five hundred dollars <laughs> for for Maestro? They're talking about Maestro. Are you, are you excited about Maestro? Are you excited about Bradley S. Cooper's second directorial project coming I out this year? Not even heard of it. So no, no, I no. I mean, it's cool. That sounds awesome, but I didn't <laughs> even know that was a thing. Yeah, where uh, where are you I'm at? Like, with... I'm like a uh, Dion or Andy, just like yes. I, I've never even heard of that. Never even heard of it. <laughs> Where are you at with Mr. Shahello? Did you like um, his, uh, Star is Born? Yeah, Star is Born was really good. I, I dug yes. that movie a lot. I thought, uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is so, yeah, for you for you and for the people listening at home that might not know what Maestro is, it is Bradley Cooper's second uh, directorial project. Um, it is him doing, let me actually look it up real quick Maestro. 2023 film directed by Bradley Cooper. It's got, um, let's see, Bradley Cooper as Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein, produced by Martin Scorsese and Spielberg and Todd Phillips. So some great uh, people there. Uh, screenplay co-written by Josh Singer, based on the life of Leonard Bernstein. Co-starring Carrie Mulligan, Jeremy Strong, one of my favorite people, Matt Bomer, Bomber, Maya Hawke, and Silver, oh, yeah. Silver, uh, Silverman. So that should be interesting, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah, solid cast there. Solid cast there, exactly. Um, speaking of most anticipated stuff this year, that'll be a lot of what we're doing here today. Going to go over some of the some of the big stuff from this year. Uh, we are recording this Saturday, uh, about th- uh, three or four days before the Academy Awards will be announced. So, are you super super duper excited? Are you? I don't know if we ever really talked about your basic like uh, interest in in the Oscars. Uh, are you are you a guy that watched them? Have you watched them periodically once it, once upon a time or never, never yeah. really? Yeah, I like I like to watch the Oscars if I'm you know I, I I'm off you know I try to I try to watch them. I'm always yes. interested in the horse race. You know I you know I yeah. do have the certain movies that I root for. Uh, this year, luckily, my two favorite movies are the two front runners. They are uh, yeah. In the, yeah, everything, everywhere, and banshees. Uh, so I'm I'm excited for that. So uh, fingers crossed that they can keep the momentum up, and and one of them can take home the gold. But yeah, it's it's always fun to watch the Oscars, and I get people who are like, oh yeah, like the the, the it doesn't mean anything. Films shouldn't be about awards, but I'm like, yeah, but it's fun. It is fun. It is quite fun. Um, so yeah, let's just talk about the the, the Gold Globes that happened, um, and we'll use that to pivot to our most anticipated star, or our, our prediction. We'll use that to pivot to, to pivot to our predictions. Um, Golden Globes winners for best movie, best motion picture, film drama was The Fablemans. So you you're correct in saying that the uh, Banshees of Inisherin and Everything Everywhere Once are the front runners. Um, I would say based off that win, The Fablemans is probably the third third horse in that race. Correct. Oh yeah, I think it's it's those three. Like Fablemans, I think was you know uh, the front runner for a while, and then it kind of dipped out. But you know, I everything everywhere was you know in the same category as Banshees, I think. So um, both of those being comedies, uh, according to the Golden Globes. Um, so you know, both of them couldn't take it. So Fablemans got to beat out the other competition. So yeah, I think it's those three, and then the field, honestly. Yeah, um, probably Tar is, is probably going to be in there for number four slot. Yeah. Um, I think Tar is like a distant fourth, honestly. Yeah. Um, and then what are we thinking for B- Blockbuster? Are they going to 
put in because we the most best motion picture drama category for the Golden Globes was Avatar, Elvis, Fablemans, Tar, and Top Gun Maverick. Do you think? <clears throat> excuse me. Do you think uh, we'll have two blockbusters in there with Avatar and Top Gun Maverick as nominations? Yes, I, I think they're both getting in um, okay. at the expense of Black Panther. I think because I think it was gonna like the, of those those three. I think two of them were always going to get in and one was not. And just based on the kind of reaction to those movies, I think that Black Panther is the odd man out. Because they're all big sequels to, to, you know, um, popular movies. Uh, You know, both Black Panther and Avatar were nominated uh, when they came out. But I don't think that uh, Wakanda Forever is going to repeat. But I do think those other two are getting in this year. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, looking at the list for Best Picture, Musical, or Comedy from the Golden Globes, Triangle of Sadness was in there. Do you see tri- Triangle of Sadness as being the Drive My Car of this year? No, I, I think by Drive My Car, what, what do you mean exactly? Uh, Drive My Car was nominated for Best Picture last year, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. what do you mean? Like, is, it's, it's You're saying it's like the, the last spot that gets in or something? Um, maybe the last spot, but also the uh, foreign film of this year. Oh okay. No, I think I think All Quiet gets the foreign film this year. Oh, Honestly, that's that's my prediction. Interesting. Um, I yeah. did come up with a, li- a pr- list of ten, and it, yeah. we should point out that this year uh, there are ten. Uh, when they changed the rules, they initially changed it to from five nominees to ten nominees, and then I think it was just that for one year, and then changed it to between five and ten, like up to ten. Um, so there haven't been ten in. Um, quite a while it's usually eight or nine uh but this year they changed it back to there have to be 10 um so i think you are going to get something like a a weird a wild card a weird one like how when they had it 10 that other time you got uh incredibly (laughs) loud extremely loud incredibly close which is a bad fucking movie that like got (laughs) trashed by critics and somehow got nominated for best picture so i think you're going to get a weird one like that um in there in the mix but I don't predict it being Triangle of Sadness. No, oh, okay. Um, and you said you had a list there. So we've already talked about um, four or five of them. We already talked about Everything, Everywhere at Once, Tar, Banshees of Inner Sharon. We'll probably get in there. Fablemans will probably get in there. Um, Top, Top, Top Gun Maverick and, and Avatar, you said, we're going to get mm-hmm. in there. What else uh, have we not mentioned yet that's on your list? Yeah, so those ones, I think, you know, the big locks, like I said, one, two, and three are the big front runners. Then I think Tar and Elvis. Um, I don't know if we, we didn't say Elvis yet, did we? We have not, no. Okay, I think Elvis is definitely, it's that biopic old person movie that yeah. the older members of the Academy <laughs> are definitely going to vote in, even though it's a bad movie. There's always a Bohemian Rhapsody or some shit like that that's a bad yeah. movie that gets in because it's a biopic. Um then yeah, the two blockbusters, Top Gun and Avatar, and then that those ones I think those 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 seven I think are our locks. I think those seven, and then the last three are where it gets really murky, and there's like ten movies jockeying for three spots. I think Babylon slips in there. Yes. Um, I think that it was more more of a sure thing before it came out. Now it's a little bit murky, but Hollywood does mo- love a movie about old Hollywood, so I think it gets in. Uh, then I like I said, all quiet. I think gets the the foreign one. There's a few ways that could go. I think it could go to decision to leave. It could go to RR. But I think all quiet is the kind of more prestigious one, and Netflix doesn't have anything else too. Is the thing because yes. Blonde is a fucking monstrosity, and <laughs> so that's really all that Netflix has. Uh, and then I think for ten, my kind of just this is my kind of like all right, something else is gonna get in, and I I think something that might not be. A front runner. I'm gonna just pick. She said. I think she said feels oh. like an Oscar. Oscar's trying to be topical. It feels like a, uh, a promising young woman. Got, woman got nominated. I think it's the same kind of. It's gonna slip in on on those merits. But like I said, ten is the wild card spot, and I, that's my wild card pick. Okay. Um, yeah, I would, I would probably agree with that. I I'm looking at the uh, Critics Choice Awards for Best Picture from this past week. Um, the only one we haven't yet talked about, which was in there, was Glass Onion. Um, I think uh, it could be She Said, could be Glass Onion, could be RRR. Um, I do see a couple of, of those type of films in the bottom there, the bottom two. The 9-10 yeah. spot could be those things. Yep. 
Yeah, there's a there's a lot of movies that could get in those those like eight through ten. There's there's a maybe maybe twenty different movies jockeying for that, um, and it could be any of them, honestly. Yeah, exactly. Any uh, early predictions about what will win? Um, we, you know, my personal one is Everything Everywhere. Um, I, uh, you know, Sean, that's Sean's pick for what will win. Um, I think he's a little colder on. It. I think him and Amanda are a bit colder on it than than we are. Um, on it personally. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I would say everything everywhere is probably the one to take it. What do you think? I think it's, it's really, it's razor thin between that. I, it's almost, it's basically a tie, I think between that and Banshees at this point. Yeah. Um, so I, I really think that give any given day, either one of them could take a slight lead. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, let me just do a couple of the, um, Best Actress uh, nominations here. Kate Blanchett won. Uh, probably going to be good, probably going to take it. You know, she took the Golden Globe. Oh, yeah. Took the Critics' Choice Awards. Um, the nominations for Crit- Critics' Choice were Viola Davis for The Woman King, Daniel Dead- Deadweiler for Till, Margot Robbie for Babylon, Michelle Williams for Fablemans, and Michelle Yao for Everything Everywhere All at Once. But it's, it's mo- it, she, Kate Blanchett probably has it locked up, right? I think that's the most sure of all of the awards is that Blanchett is that's like like what how sure Will Smith was last year that they were like this is going to be his year yeah. um uh that this is this is the Blanchett year where that's that's what's going to happen like and th- some of the other awards you know they might seem like a sure thing but this is like a lock like she's got it absolutely um then moving on to best actor uh Brandon Fraser won at the Critics Choice Awards um, for the Whale. Um, I yeah, I, I would say that uh, want want that him to win, and also probably will win. Is that um, other other possibilities are Austin Butler? Unfortunately, <laughs> for Elvis, yeah. he's the um, he's the Rami Malek of this year. Uh, unfortunately, mm-hmm. uh, Tom Cruise for Top Gun Maverick, probably not. Uh, Colin Farrell for Banshees. I don't see him getting it. Yeah. Yeah, the second second uh, choice would probably be Colin Farrell for Banshees, right? I think I think they honestly it's it's really close between the two of them because Farrell took the Golden Globe and then Frazier took the Critics' Choice, so it's it's really tight between them. And then I think you've got Austin Butler kind of uh, you know as the the dark horse, and then there then you, there could be a number of different people um, getting in those last two spots. But I, I think that those three are definitely all getting in. Um, and it's gonna, probably going to be a two-person race. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, there's um, – going back to Best Actress real quick. Have you seen <laughs> this, like, weird AstroTurf campaign going on with uh, Andrea Riceborough and To Leslie about all these actors sort of promoting To Leslie at the last minute to try to get her nominated for – or to get that picture nominated for something, to get her nominated for Best, for best Actress? Have you seen this? I have not. Yeah, so it's it's a weird like, so just for people that don't know, uh, I think I was talking to Deanne about this about how how this sort of process works is like you you don't just you know <laughs> put in a good good performance. You have to like uh, you know shake hands, rub babies, whatever, mm-hmm. the, you know do all that ass kissing stuff. Um, rub for, babies, rub baby, <laughs> you know, <laughs> shake hands, <laughs> kiss babies, all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> to you know make your case for why you should be why you should win the award you know you have to go out there and sort of talk about the film talk about the making of it you know glad hand that's the word i was trying to think of (laughs) glad hand Mm -hmm. um people um throughout you know from basically january or starting even before that you know for months and months months you have to go out there promoting your film um again even even after it comes out so um everybody's been doing that you know the uh, Kate's obviously been doing that. Margot Robbie's been doing that. Michelle Williams, a little bit, not really. Uh, Michelle Yao, obviously her and uh, mm-hmm. Jamie Lee Curtis have been all all out there, putting their face out there, doing that kind of stuff, red carpet stuff that you have to do if you if you want to win the award. Um, and Andrew Riceborough in the movie for To Leslie hasn't been doing that for the last few months and just started <laughs> started that weird yeah. campaign. And it's just a weird sort of um, tempo and a weird sort of. Why would you start now when it's like, you know, six weeks until mm-hmm. the Oscars? So that was just a weird thing yeah. where you have like a bunch of different I don't have the thing pulled up exactly, but uh, a lot of a lot of very obviously canned and sort of copy pasted um responses and promotions for that movie has been mm-hmm. popping up on Twitter recently. So that's that's really all that was. 
Yeah. Do you do you also get like the uh the ads for like for your consideration like when you're like on the internet because i get that yeah. shit all the time it's like i am not in the academy like what yeah um, like i have no voting power like i get, <laughs> I get those ads all the time and it's I probably because i just google like oscar frontrunners and stuff all the time yeah but i'll st- it's like i'll just get for your consideration and in all categories black panther will kind of forever i'm like all right, I'm just some dude who has a podcast. Like yeah. I, I have no like if the academy <laughs> wants to give me a vote, that would be rad. But that's not happening now. Right? Yeah. Don't don't let Andy hear this because he'll flip out and be like, "They're listening to you. Your ads are the ads are based on the things <laughs> they hear from you." No, dude. If you look at if you try to like type with your voice, if you try to use your voice to type shit out, it's still bad. Like they still haven't figured out how to listen to your voice just doing the keyboard. Never mind listening to you sell you Wheaties or whatever. It's it just doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, but anyways, to Leslie, let's see. There's an article on IndieWire about the. Uh, celebrity back Oscar campaign for Two Leslie. Um, Gwyneth Paltrow, Kate Winslet are suddenly backing it. A lot of people are talking about. Kate Winslet was giving an interview the the other day about saying this. It's the most. Uh, it's one of the best performances this year. I'm trying to find exactly because there was like a a very interesting uh, copy and pasted thing. Everyone when everyone was calling it. They were calling it like a small film with a big heart, and, and it was just the <laughs> same. If you search that that phrase on Twitter, like 17 people said the same thing. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it's very, very weird thing. But she's a very good actress, so yeah. I would, I would like to see yeah, yeah. some love given to her. Um, so let's see. Let's just do a couple more, then we can move on. Um, best director, um, Daniel Kwan and Daniel Shiner won the Critics' Choice Award for uh, best director this past week. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's a very weird uh, award because it's like, do you give it based on the? Performances, how how good the directors were out at give at you know bringing out good performances. Do you give it based on cinematography? Do you give it based on story? There's so, it's a very weird award that I I think I don't know how you sort of decide the parameters and the qualifications for giving that award are. Um, so James Cameron is also up for it. Uh, da- Damien Chazelle up for Babylon. Todd Field for Tar. Uh, I actually I'm gonna go with uh, Martin McDonough. I think yeah. Didn't he yeah. get the Golden Globe? Uh, he did not. Stevie did. Old Stevie that's Spielberg. Right. That's right. I'm gonna I'm gonna say Madonna. I'm gonna say Madonna. Even though Daniel yeah, Shiner and Daniel Kwan. It, this are, is a tough yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. It is. There's a lot so, of a lot of good directors and a lot of Academy darlings in this one. And it's a, like you said, it's a weird category. It's hard yeah. to pick until the Directors Guild gives their awards. Then that's yes. usually a pretty good indication. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, anyways, uh, we're looking forward to that this Tuesday. Um, I think they're coming out very early in the morning. So we'll <laughs> be the first yeah, one posting yeah, about that. <laughs> yeah, super early. So uh, let's move on. We got a list of uh, most anticipated stuff this year. Uh, I think we have a pretty good idea of stuff that's coming out. I sent you a list of, uh, you know, of everything, nerdy and otherwise. Mm-hmm. So this week we'll be doing the nerdy stuff. And then the following week we'll be doing, we'll be doing more of the uh, prestigious stuff, the quote unquote prestigious mm-hmm. stuff the the maestros and the yeah. all of that other stuff <laughs> the yeah week. this is this is for me the way i split it up was like you know there's the yeah there's the like awards baity kind of serious movies and then there's the popcorn movies there's the blockbusters you know the things that are ip <laughs> and you know their fantasy and sci-fi driven there is one we talked about that was there's a the sci-fi one that we were like oh is this this feels very prestige uh, yeah. So we were like, we, we, we and I were talking about, we we decided to put that as the, um, the, uh, the kind of you know, more um, uh, uh, critical one. And so other than that, though, this, these are very um, genre driven films. Genre driven. Yes, genre. Exactly. That's that's the right word for it. Um, I'm just looking at the list real quick. Did we decide on Dune? Because I don't have Dune in here. Spoiler alert. No, that's have... what I was talking about. That's, that's yeah. the one I was alluding to. Yeah, I think yeah. We, we said that uh, Dune we were going to do next week because it is yes. it is kind of like got a foot in both um, both camps because it's like yes. the first one got nominated for Best Picture. and uh, But it is still like a big sci-fi thing. But it is this. Epic. It feels like a Lord of the Rings where it's like, oh, this is like an epic movie, even though it is sci-fi. It's it's like a Lawrence of Arabia, but fucking, you know, <laughs> with like sandworms or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so let's get started um, at my number 10 most anticipated nerdy thing for the year of our Lord 2023 is Agatha Coven of Chaos. Um, mm. Loved loved her performance. Loved uh 
what's her name? Um, Catherine Hahn's performance in WandaVision. Definitely looking forward to this, just based on the people that are also in it. There are people that are going to be around her. I feel like Aubrey Plaza also brings that sort of chaotic energy with her to every yes. role she has. Yeah, yeah. Have you uh, seen her when she does? She does the. She would wrote that like Christmas witch book, and she she like <laughs> gave interviews as the Christmas witch. It's fucking brilliant. Addresses the Christmas witch. It's really brilliant. She's definitely yeah. got that like spooky girl energy. She she really does that weird chaotic spooky girl energy. I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, like all of my exes, I'm just like, oh no. <laughs> Uh, I loved her in uh, Emily the Criminal from from last year. I don't know if you caught up with that I, yet. I needed to see that. I still have, yeah. like I was trying to rewatch a bunch of shit at the end of the year before we did our best of show, and I just didn't get get a chance to catch that one yet. Yeah, yeah, it should be pretty cool. This is one of those that it's like TBD. They're saying it's it's this mm. year. Um, the last thing I I found about any specific time frame was winter twenty twenty three. So still sort of mm-hmm. counts. Um, is this anywhere yeah. on your list? No, I mean it didn't make my list. Um, I, yeah. I, uh, you know, I'm excited for it, but it's I'm like okay, it's just like a spinoff. You know, it's it could be good. It has a lot of potential, but yeah, it's it's definitely not something that I'm like, oh man, I can't wait for Agatha. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm just excited for it because hopefully it'll be one of those that's that's bringing the MCU back to its feet. You know, after all the yeah. fa- phase four stuff, fa- hopefully the phase five stuff gets even weirder. Um, so yeah, yeah. What is I, your, I like Catherine yeah. Hahn a lot. That would be my main yeah. reason to dig it is because she's just incredible. Yeah, absolutely. What is your number 10 anticipated thing of this year? Uh, my number 10 is Transformers Rise of Beasts or Rise of the Beasts. I don't know which it is. Yes. Um, but yeah, so this is, uh, I guess it's, a, I think it's a reboot of tra- the Transformers series. I guess it's a, technically it's, it continues the reboot that Bumblebee was, which I didn't see, but I wanted to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean... I loved Transformers as I was a kid. I was definitely at the age because I grew up in the '90s of the you know Beast Wars and all that stuff. So I'm excited to see that. Uh, I'm excited to see a Transformers movie that is not directed by Michael Bay because he obviously has not given a shit about that series since the first one. <laughs> uh, and it's a reboot. It's it is set in the '90s, so you know it's it's not like it's num- my number ten. Uh, so it's not super you know it's not super high on my list. But I'm like there is a lot of upside to this one. And I think just the fact that it is this thing that I love from the 90s and it's set in the 90s is enough to make me be like, all right, let's see what we got here. I'm excited to check out. And there's some new blood injected into the Transformers franchise, and that's always a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We got uh, Anthony Ramos uh, starring in this. Got a bunch of uh, interesting voices. Peter Cullen, obviously, coming back as Optimus Prime. We got uh, Ron Perlman as Optimus Primal. Uh, Peter Dinklage as Scourge. Uh, Pete Davidson as Mirage, uh, <laughs> Shell Yao as Air Razor. That should be pretty cool. Hey, you can't see me. All right, I'm a Mirage. What are you gonna do? Come on. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, let's so let's say number nine for me, John Wick, Chapter Four. Mm. <laughs> the Wick is back, y'all. Oh my god. Um, so I saw. I'm thinking I, I'm back. I'm thinking I'm back. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. <laughs> Get me all the guns. No, you're, that, was the, that was another movie. Um, I saw I saw John Wick 1 in theaters, and then I saw 2 and 3 back-to-back on Netflix. Um, yeah, it's, it's it should be interesting. I think, uh, unfortunately, um, Ken Reeves is not immune. He's not as immortal as we thought he, he once was. I think he's starting to slow down in his older age, so I'm not sure uh, how excited I am for that, for that particular, like, high high intensity, high voltage action that he that he brought to the first couple, um, which still should be pretty cool. Uh, it's got Donnie Yen, Bill Skarsgård, Lawrence Fishburne's coming back in this, Lance Reddick. Always love that guy. And you got Scott Atkins. Scott Atkins is one of these guys that I never really knew about, but I guess he's one of like the top uh top martial arts and stunt stunt coordinators in, oh, in, yeah, in yeah, Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that should be pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely I mean excited I'm excited this. for it. Uh yeah. I, I didn't I lo- I really like the John Wick films, but I don't think like I'm not as insane about them as a lot of people are. Like they're like the first two for me like were four star films, not five star films, and then it, there was just a little bit of sheen that came off with the third one. Like I was like, I was like, all right. Um, yeah. So hopefully, hopefully, you know, they stay consistent because um, they've been all I've enjoyed them all a lot, but they're they're not like I'm not crazy. I didn't see any of them in the theaters, so I'll, maybe I'll try and catch this one in the theaters. But you know, they're they're fun action movies. You know. Yeah, definitely should be uh, coming out pretty soon in March twenty fourth. 
So I'll be checking that, that out then. Uh, what is your number nine? Uh, my number nine is uh, Secret Invasion. Uh, you know, this is a Marvel TV show. I don't have a lot of TV on my list, but this is... Um, Actually, I think both of the show things I have on my list are that are TV or Marvel. Uh, slight spoiler, but um, yeah, I mean, this is a cool concept. It could be a lot of different things. They have been clearly setting this up. I don't know if Mendo is coming back for that, but they would be fucking rad if he does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like there's you know the the, the scrolls they've always been there's like so much potential in them in the movies and they they're just barely utilized. So to see this this cool really cool comic storyline, um developed more in full uh they could do a lot it's another one where there's like a lot of potential in this it could be something super cool uh that i'm excited for yeah it's got um sam jackson obviously ben Mendelssohn, uh a bunch of people are from okay, good, good yeah captain marvel's coming back for this um uh kingsley benadir uh millie clark and then you got you know olivia coleman martin freeman like i said don Cheadle. um i really hope they I know this is probably filmed way before Andor came out, but I feel like Andor is doing a lot of this stuff uh, as well as you can do with, you know, genre mm-hmm. television. Um, you know, the sort of secret espionage, backdoor dealings, sort of very, very much grounded in the espionage uh, genre. So mm-hmm. very, very cool if, it, if they get that spycraft stuff right. Yeah. And I just hope that they're like, every week they're like, this book. I thought it was a scroll the whole time. You're like, oh my god! I thought that. And they, they, they could do. There's a lot of options for cool cameos and stuff like that. They could do where they could be like, oh, this is a guy who's been dead, but oh, just kidding. This is a, like a scroll, you know. Just like they could do all kinds of cool stuff, you know. With this, uh, so really excited to see what they do. Yeah, absolutely. And this was actually number, my number uh, two of the year. So oh. very excited about this. Yep. Uh, so yeah, my number eight is Craven the Hunter. So a lot of Marvel stuff, uh, oh. Marvel slash Sony stuff, yeah, on my list this year. Very, very anticipating a lot of this um, getting back to getting back to where they were pre-Phase 4 um, with this. I'm not sure. Have they talked about how the Sony stuff is going to weave into the MCU or if at all? I'm not I really think sure. It's, well, I think it's just that it's another universe. It's like yeah. part of the multiverse. Um, I really don't think that Marvel is really gives a shit about them i think because sony is just making um whatever they're making and i don't think sony is putting any plans in but they're just like let's just stick in the vulture at the end of the morbius movie and we'll figure out later how it makes sense (laughs) uh this was not on my list just like i mean it could be good but like the sony movies have been dog shit like yeah you know even venom one which was probably the best of them was just okay if that so like I mean, and Morbius was, Morbius was Morbius. Um, so <laughs> I mean, I'm going into this with a big grain of salt. I mean, uh, yeah, we'll, well see. I guess. Yeah, the only reason I'm super excited about, uh, or you know, mildly excited. I don't know I'm somewhere excited <laughs> on the on the on the spectrum there. Um, Aaron Taylor Johnson, obviously playing Craven the Hunter. Um, mm-hmm. Great stuff. Very recently with with Bullet Train and with Tenant. Um, and also uh, J.C. Shandor directing. Uh, he's the guy that did Margin Call, All is Lost, Most Violent Year, Tri- Tri- Triple Frontier. Um, really, I think he, I think he knows how to do action really well. I think he films action really well. So that's part of my excitement there. That's a big part of my excitement. Yeah. With that. Yep. Well, I mean, maybe I'll be wrong. I will, I hope I'm wrong, but I just I can't give any faith to <laughs> Sony live action Marvel movies like at this yeah. point. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is your number eight? Uh, my number eight's Rebel Moon. Uh, so if people aren't aware, this is uh, Zack Snyder wanted to make a Star Wars, and Star- Lucasfilm was like, no, thank you. And he was like, well, fine. <laughs> I'll go make my own Star Wars with flapjacks and hookers. <laughs> and so he's going to make his own Star Wars, and I'm kind of glad that he is doing it without um, the watchful eye of the mouse on him. Uh, Zack Snyder is someone who, while his fan base is uh, the worst, uh, he actually, I think, is a pretty fascinating filmmaker and to see his take on this and it to be uh not have to worry about tell it like keeping in line with any mythology he can just do something that's instead of being in this mythology is just inspired by this mythology i think it could be really cool it's going to be a netflix original movie um so yeah this one could be really cool and interesting and zack snyder I, I, I like to see when he gets weird you know like like i like i eat one of the three people in the world who liked sucker punch so i'll be excited for this <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, coming out December twenty second on Netflix. We got 
Mm. So Sophia Batella, which I I mostly know her from the trailer for the the Mummy movie with Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> she's uh, in uh, she's in Kingsman. She's oh, in Kingsman. Right. Exactly. She's yes. like the legs. She's <laughs> <laughs> cut you up with her legs. She cut mm. up Mark Hamill with the leg. <laughs> uh, we also got Ed Screen, uh, Ray Fisher, Charlie Hunnam, Anthony Hopkins going to come in here. That's pretty cool. Very nice. Corey Stoll yeah, too. Yeah. Oh, wow, big big cast. Good nice. good cast. Good cast. Yes, indeed. Uh, so as your number eight, let's see. Going to my number seven, May fifth, twenty twenty three. We finally get to see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I'm so fucking excited for this. Um, just based on, you know, again, I sound like a broken record, but it's, you know, so the Guardians movies in the past were some of the most, you know, consequential to the overarching story of the MCU because you had, <clears throat> you literally had, you know, Thanos in, was it part one or part two was he in? Where I think it was part one, right? Because he was talking to. Um, yeah, because it's he's the Gamora's his dad. Yeah, he's in, he was, yeah, yeah, he's in the first one. Yeah, yeah, he's in the first one. Yeah, so I mean, they are. Oh yeah, and he's talking to um Lee yeah. Pace. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> tall guy. Um, so this should hopefully you know again bring bring wrap around all this stuff we're talking about with the um this is coming out after um Ant Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Um, so hopefully you know all of the stuff that they're that they've been leading up to. I think they're they're finally. I think there's there's been a bunch of articles, and there's been a bunch of uh, you know videos made about oh you know this this te- this technology that we're seeing in the trailers for Ant Man and the Wasp. A lot of that stuff looks like um, stuff that we saw back in um, Shang Chi. A lot of the same sort of pulsating energy coming out of Kang's arms look look like the stuff from uh, Shang Chi's arms as well. So hopefully, Guardians will in some way sort of you know with Adam Warlock being one of the most powerful cosmic beings in the comic books, they'll hopefully do something with that where they're like you know this is Adam Warlock and this is getting into the even more spatial and even more weird and even more cosmic area of the Marvel comics. So I'm really, really excited for this one. Yeah. I mean, should I just, if it's higher up on my <laughs> list, should I just say where I've got it now? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. All right. I got, I got this at my number four. Um, okay. and, and I'll say that, yeah, I, I'm really hyped for this. Uh, I, I, you know, not as much for the reasons of like what could be the larger ramifications for the MCU, yeah. but just because I, I like James Gunn. I've liked all of his superhero movies. I've liked, uh, all of his, the Guardians movies and the Guardians holiday special have been really great. I I loved these characters. I'm really excited to see where they go, especially after you know what happened with them after Endgame and then the brief uh, moment that we got them in uh, Thor. Uh, just yeah, excited to see the culmination of their journey, especially since James Gunn is the first guy to complete a trilogy in, in Marvel. Like they usually will shuffle directors out or directors will get burnt out or whatever might happen. And, uh, but he has, you know, despite being fired, um, at one point yeah. is able to finish his trilogy. I'm really excited to see what he does with that to tell this complete story. And I like that he is just we like he's getting weird with it. Like he's, <laughs> this, he's just seems like they're just letting him do kind of what he wants to do with these characters. Um, so I'm really excited to see how that culminates. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Where's my okay? And what was your number seven? Yeah, my number seven was uh, Dungeons and Dragons: uh, Honor Amongst Thieves. I believe is the subtitle. Yes. Uh, this is the point <laughs> in the list where it's just kind of like, all right, yeah. this is this is what what's what's a uh, what titles do I like? What what uh <laughs> you know what IPs? What yeah. IPs am I going for? And I'm a big D and D guy. Uh, actually, tomorrow, as of we're recording, I am going to be playing the finale for a campaign that i've been dming for for about four or five years now wow um so yeah and you know how many people can say they actually end a campaign uh so yeah. you know but it's been a lot of fun so i'm excited to see what they do with it just based on the bits i've seen it looks like they're the archetypes of the characters are very interesting and the plot seems i hope the plot is just something like you would see in a D session where just things kind of divert and don't make sense and it seems like they're going one way and then one character just does something completely stupid and it just changes the trajectory of everything so there's, <laughs> there's a good cast in this you know it looks really good uh so yeah this one should be a lot of fun i'm gonna see it with my um my uh my table that i play with uh we're all gonna go out and try and see it um so yeah this should be a good time 
Nice. That's really cool that you get uh, to finish that campaign. Is it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Is it? Um, what was I going to say? It, you know, was it? Um, did you make the whole like world? I mean, how? How? I, I never really played D and D. So, is it something where you sort of took a pre-built thing, or is it from scratch, or how do how do you do that? Yeah. So for me, I uh, there are like modules you can run and storylines you can run through. Um, I just, and like, there is like the worlds that, you know, you can play in like, uh, this is getting nerdy, but like Faerun or like, you know, whatever, like, you know, there's all these different settings, but I, I homebrewed all that. Uh, I, it's my own setting. It's, it's my own, and it's based on my own writing, um, that I am doing and have been doing for years. I kind of was like, all right, well, I need to come up with something. I was like, well, I've already been working on this fantasy setting for like years. So I might as well just have the players play in this. Um, so yeah, it's set in the, obviously just, and, um, just kind of this, the past of this world that I've been creating. And, um, I do take elements and stuff from the books. I I do take like monsters and things because it's really hard, hard and time consuming and pointless to just create everything on a micro level like that and but I, and I take like weapons from books and things like that but as far as like the storyline goes it's just driven by me and then my players obviously they get to choose what they want to do um so yeah i i'm a you know me being a creative person a storyteller a writer that's that's how i can't see playing a pre-made module like that's just not something i could ever do honestly yeah yeah that's very cool congrats on that um thank you yep um, so my number six most anticipated thing this year is actually something that already started. The Last of Us uh, came out Sunday, mm-hmm. started Sunday. Um, actually really excited to, uh, you know, watch a game, <laughs> watch the story <laughs> of The Last of Us just being played out in front of me. Um, I think, you know, obviously, uh, what is his name here? Uh, do, 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 do they always have the names? Pedro Pascal, obviously one of the one of the best actors out there right now, doing a bunch of mm-hmm. genre stuff with Game of Thrones and Mandalorian. It's always nice to see the guy's face, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering if that was part of his deal of like, hey, I know this place, I know this <clears throat> um, Last of Us takes place in a world where it gets some some airborne disease, but if we could just not <laughs> somehow get around that, <laughs> so I don't have to wear a gas mask the entire time. That'd be fantastic. Um, Bella, Bella Ramsey uh, was in a little bit of the first episode, not as much as I would like, but uh, she was always great on, on Game of Thrones. Um, so that should be very interesting. That uh, Gabriel Luna, Gabriel Luna as Tommy Joel's probably not that Gabriel. Oh, that okay. I'm thinking of the other guy. What's his name from uh, Andor? Diego Luna. Diego Luna. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all these, got... all these swarthy, hot Latin men in Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, we there's an actress in the show uh, by the name of Anna Torv, which a lot of people were mentioning. Oh, yeah, she was great in. Uh, one second, she was in. People were mentioning it. I was like, oh, I've never seen that show. Uh, Fringe. She was on Fringe, apparently. I never saw mm. Fringe, but um, apparently she was very good in that. But the show that I did see that I wish they would bring back, which they probably won't, was Mindhunter, which was one of my favorite shows on Netflix that they only did two seasons of. Um, she was really great on that. She's really great in this, playing playing Tess um, alongside uh, uh, Paul. Um, yeah, very interesting. Very interesting dynamic mm-hmm. they have where, <laughs> I don't know if you saw on Twitter, people were like, yeah, she probably hits that from the back. They, they probably have that <laughs> <laughs> sort of peg, pegging situation going on there. It seemed like just what that was happening there. So very good show. I, I'm assuming you've watched the first episode. I haven't got a chance. I've just been so oh, no. busy. And it's, it's, it's why I also haven't gotten a chance to watch the Letterbox Shuffle is just between planning this final campaign and doing... I've been working nights and and doing uh, uh doing a lot of other things for podcasts. I'm trying to guest on in my own yeah. podcast, uh, so I just I just didn't have enough time this week to watch the things I wanted uh, to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very good show. Um, what is your number six? Uh, my number six is Loki season two. Uh, so yeah, so Loki we might wanna, season one. Yeah, we can save this if you want because this is way. Oh up, yeah, okay. we'll save. It. Let's save way it. Way up higher. Yep, way right, up I'll, higher. I'll save it. I'll save it then. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, so let's go to my number five. Across the Spider Verse. This is one of those that has a very tangential. Ooh, maybe we should save it. Let's oh, save it. Save that one. Okay, right, we'll save that one as well. <laughs> Put that in your pocket. Your back yeah. pocket. Yes. Uh, number my number four. Okay, your number five. What is your number five? All right, my number five. Oh yeah. All right. 
Yes. Uh, is uh, okay. I don't think you'll have this one. Peter Pan and Wendy. Uh, no. <laughs> so this is obviously. Yeah. yeah this is the uh, live action uh, remake from uh, Peter Pan because that's what Disney does nowadays. Is they yeah. make Marvel movies and Star Wars movies and live action remakes of their classic films. Uh, and this is a movie that I would not have any excitement in normally. Uh, I don't really care about the old Peter Pan movie. In fact, I went back and rewatched it a couple of years ago during the pandemic. I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to be probably a little racist. It's like, oh, my God, this is like <laughs> this is like what the Washington football team used to be named racist. Like, this is bad. <laughs> like, uh, But but uh, the thing is that David Lowry is directing this movie and that guy is a goddamn genius. And he made yep. Pete's Dragon, which makes me cry like a fucking baby every time i watch it so if he could do that with a disney property uh the remake of pete's Dra- uh, pete's dragon was originally live action so but it's still you know a kind of a live action remake so his track record's amazing i've loved um i loved the green knight uh so like yeah i just i anything this guy does um i'm, I'm so down for um so i'm really curious to see uh what he ends up doing with uh peter pan and wendy it's very cool. Um, wasn't even aware of that. That's one of those I didn't even know. Never heard even heard. Yeah, of. I think it's. I think it's <laughs> going to be a Disney Disney Plus. One of those Disney Plus releases. Sometime in twenty twenty three, pending TBD, TBD to twenty twenty three. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That was so. your number five. So let's see. My number four is another TBD. A lot of stuff is like, yeah, maybe, maybe this year, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, what if? What if season two? Should be mm. should be out this year. I really liked. I binged the whole thing. Went back and watched it after it was out for a few months. Um, yeah, I thought the whole thing about um, robot, Mister Mister Robot guy, Ultron. Oh, Ultron! Know, super super yeah, super power super powered Ultron um, was a very cool idea. I, I loved how they sort of weaved in and out of you know everybody's storyline. I feel like that is <laughs> the microcosm. That's like the the mini version of what I want out of the entire MCU of just having like, you know, these little little separate stories but then have the weaving in and out of this main main sort of narrative. So that was very cool. I'd be, I'd be yeah, very interested yeah. to see. Yeah, I'd be very see, uh, interested to see if they do, you know, uh keep going with that world with that same universe or if they do uh, you know, a separate thing with the second season. So highly anticipating that one from this year, hopefully. Yeah, this didn't quite make my list, but I I, I did consider it. I, I really liked the first season. I did like you said it was it was cool that it was an anthology, but it kind of all tied together in the end. Um, and just yeah, it's cool to see the Elseworlds, and they can obviously do a lot with animation. That even though live action, they they can do so much. There's some stuff that is just like literally impossible, and they can do it in animation. So that's cool to see. So excited to see more just kind of weird other world stories that can sometimes end on a sad note. I do like that too, about what if some of them are just like really depressing yeah. and it's okay. Cause it's an alternate universe and it doesn't affect anything. It's just here. It's own little thing. And i like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what is your number four? My number four is, uh, guardians three. Oh yeah. We are talked about it. We did. Yes. All right. Uh, yes, yes, so, so going up to number three for me is Ant-Man and the wasp coming out very, very shortly here. February 17th, 2023. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that the last trailer that came out, I feel like a lot of people were saying, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> they showed a lot of things. And uh, maybe, maybe too many things. That's why I don't watch trailers. Yeah, yeah it's possible. Yeah. I mean, with, with stuff like this, my philosophy is like, I know, it's the uh, good guy's going to win, bad guy's going to lose probably. Uh. But I'm just, just interested in see the process of how that happens. Uh, looks very... It looks it looks dark. I think a lot of people were saying. Um, I, I don't mean like like physically dark, but you know, to, tonally dark. Mm. Um, yeah, I yeah. think a lot of people were saying, eh, again, not not great, not great CGI. I didn't. I uh, I mean, it's with, with with this stuff with with the magical, with the weird and wild, with the, with the absurd stuff. That that really doesn't bother me as much as like questionable CGI when it comes to you know real life you know buildings or mm-hmm, f- flying mm-hmm. things or real world uh, places. If you're just if you're in the quantum realm, which nobody's ever seen, it's like that's that's fine. Um, yeah, but, it's harder to fall into the uncanny valley with something yeah. that doesn't exist. You know. Yeah, exactly. That's a great way to put it. Um, so yeah, very very excited to see where they go with this because again, like I said, this this. Probably, I don't see any way of this not having, you know, severe consequences for the upcoming couple of movies. It's they're literally called <laughs> the the uh, 
uh, why can't I remember the guy's name? Uh, the, K- Kang, oh. Kang Dynasty. Kang, you know? Kang Dynasty. K- yeah, yeah. Kang is the is, is his name is in the marquee. It's it's that yeah. thing's coming, and so I yeah. really don't think there is any way of this thing ending without it directly leading to to that. So very excited for that. Yeah, it's gonna lead right into Creed Three. It's crazy. <laughs> Dude, that guy got huge. That guy's Jack. Like, right? Here's the thing about the Creed movies. They he's won every time. And I feel like the the sort of draw of the originals um original Rocky movies was that he didn't win all the time. You know, his, his Well friend, he lost the first one he did. and then he won every time after that. That's why the first Rocky's yeah. the only Rocky that I think is really right. that great. That's yeah, that's that's understandable. But yeah, he's just won every time and now he's versing this other dude that just looks like a fucking monster. So I think it's very gonna be <laughs> ridiculous if he pulls puts out this one as well. So it'd be cool to see that one. Uh what yeah. let's see. What is your number three? All right, so we're touching back to one you talked about. So I'll let you talk about it first. Um, we're um, back to Across the Spider Verse is my number three. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah. So um, again, with a lot of these things, it's it's TBD because I think it was already delayed, right? It was delayed like maybe like a year. I think the original. Yeah. Yeah, the original release date was pushed back a year. Right now it's June second, twenty twenty three. So they do have a s- solid release date right now. So that's good. Yeah, I really, I think the first one was one of those, like, oh, I didn't know you could do this. It was one of those, like, uh, superhero movies had been one thing before this, and then they can be something else completely different after this. Of Like, you know, you can show, you can shoot in an interesting way. You can have all these different, it doesn't have to be serious, doesn't have to be, like, world-ending thing. It can be a grounded thing, but also very weird and absurd and different, With and you can show all these different types of, uh, spider men spider ladies and spider things and pig spiders and old man spiders and all the different spider men coming together which I thought was a very very cool movie and definitely looking forward to the second one yeah like the first one I thought was amazing one of the best animated movies I've ever seen just looked yeah. unlike anything I'd seen um, the plot was so cool it did the spider man no way home thing before spider man no way home where it just brings in all the different spider men you get they're all so distinct and interesting. You obviously get the Jake Johnson one, but then you have the you have Miles and you have um, Gwen, and they're all so amazing. And this one, they they introduced you to that now, and now it's like okay, now we're gonna get even more weirdness. We're gonna get even more craziness. There's gonna be all these different Spider Man, all these different dimensions coming in. You know, it's Lord and Miller. Um, so I'm I'm really excited to see just the kind of weird, crazy antics that they can bring to this one. And the first one just had so much heart in it uh it was something that i was skeptical i was like why is there so news just making a spider-man animated movie to just cash in like why do, this doesn't need to exist and then i was so proven wrong like it, it was amazing i've rewatched it a bunch of times it it feels like what spider-man really spider-man was my favorite hero when i was a kid and he just it really feels like it it captures the essence of spider-man and just how you know he just wants to help people and yeah, it it does a great job, and and what it really means to be Spider Man, and the I you know anyone can be Spider Man in that movie was such a cool thing, and I'm excited to see what happens in the sequel. Yes, yes, can't wait for that. Um, so let's get to let's see. We talked about Secret Evasion. Secret Evasion was my number two. So mm-hmm. we talked about that one. Talked about Ant Man. Talked about uh, Across the Spider Verse. I think we're at number ones, right? No, no, we haven't we haven't uh, hit twos yet. Twos yet? Okay. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. What's your number two? My number two was Secret Invasion. Um, okay. So we have to do your number two. All right. So my number two is yes. all right. I don't think you have either of my top two. Then. Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, because I think I know what number number one is. Then based yes. on process of elimination. Yes. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> my number two is the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, uh, oh. which is the Hunger Games prequel. Um, I fucking love the Hunger Games. I've loved all of the books. I, uh, I've loved all of the films. I think there are some of the best adaptations um, for the of any source material, especially something that is adapting there that kind of there in it, in its wake. So many they were like, well, this is a teen dystopian future, uh, so we've got to make put all of these into production. Let's every every one of these. There's a million of those books, so let's just Maze make all the movies. And yeah. none of the movies were good except for like they're all there's degrees may vary of like like Maze Runner whatever series but like yeah hunger games is hunger games is so good like just the way that it deals with like authoritarianism and fascism and stuff and it feels very prescient for 
you know, the book, first book, I think, came out in 2008. The first film came out in 2012. And it wrapped up in, I think, 2015. And then, of course, what all the things that happened in 2016, uh, it felt very ahead of its time. Uh, this one, I, I'm i very excited for. Uh, the book came out in 2020, like, right when the pandemic was starting. Like, it came out in March uh, 2020. Uh, I read the book. Uh, it was a really interesting book. Uh, Snow, who is kind of a the main antagonist of the um, original series, it gives his backstory, and he is just this kind of, like, I think it got misconstrued a little bit. People are like, "Oh, Snow, what if when what if when he was hot at like the <laughs> sexy freedom fighter?" And it's like, "No, this is clearly it's it's doing the same thing. It 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 does what I wish the, the what the Star Wars prequels tried to do, where it's like it shows someone who is this flawed person and he he is kind of an idealist, but and it shows you why he is the way he is and he's never quite sympathetic but you he is a little bit but you're like at the same time you're like yeah this this guy sucks you see <laughs> sucks but you understand why he sucks and you see like he, he's him starting in poverty and you understand why he like wanted to cling to power so much because his fan like the his whole family died and so it's i'm very excited for this um i think these are despite them being like kind of adaptations of why things are are incredibly mature and nuanced um and yeah uh i'm I'm really down for this one nice it's it's got um same director as the uh at least a couple of the other hundred games movies um director of constantine french lawrence is also doing this mm-hmm. one uh coming out november 17th so i might check that out i always have an aversion i have a weird aversion to uh dystopian uh ya stuff so no and i get it because like yeah it's it's like 95 percent of it is not good but this yeah. is like <laughs> this is this is and this is the one that in it's like it was good and then it's awake everyone was like all right we gotta adapt all these and you're like you really don't though that's not what made the hunger games good yeah. like you, you're missing what made the hunger games good yeah yeah all right maybe i'll check it out uh so we're at number one uh my number one is obviously clearly the thing we haven't talked about, Loki season two, Loki season one was one of my favorite things, one of my favorite shows of that year, my number one uh, MCU thing of phase four, one of my favorite uh, MCU things overall, um, obviously because it had some of the most impactful stuff for the MCU going forward. It had Tom Hiddleston, it had uh, Sylvie played by Sophia DiMartino, had Owen Wilson, it had all these amazing uh, supporting cast members, this really incredibly inventive and great looking set design. I feel like, um, and you had the uh, amazing supporting cast with, uh, let me see. Like do, 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 Robert do, do, do. or Tom or something like he's the, he's the, also the old guy in fucking, uh, rise of Skywalker. Who's like, yeah. I served you in the old war. <laughs> let me pull up the thing here. Let me go to the LCG. Uh, Richard, is this his first name? Richard something. Where is that it? sounds right. That sounds right. He's got a like very basic uh, da, da, da. white guy. Richard name, E. Grant like. was in the first one. Richard E. Yes. Grant. Yes. Yep. 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 Should have known. Should have known. <laughs> so a lot of people just come coming back. Um, they don't have him on here. I think he would, he pretty much died in the first one. Correct. He was he died. Uh, yeah. Pushing back that thing. Uh, what else was I going to say about this? Um, you know, obviously going to be consequential with with. Uh, with Kang being the guy at the end, being the one who remains, being the main villain at the end there. So I'm very, very, very excited to see what this means, what is going to happen, how is this going to tie into everything else. We also have uh, Ki'i Kwan was revealed to have been cast in this. Yes. Yeah. So, so many things, yeah. so many reasons to be excited for this. I cannot freaking wait. Uh, but the, the only thing is they have a solidified release date says mid 2023 so hopefully Mm -hmm. won't be too long for that yeah no i'm i'm excited like i said this was my number six um you know i really dug loki season one i i like that it just got to this the weird side of marvel and that it's since it's existing in this thing where it's like okay yeah like it does still obviously have consequences but it's like it felt like they can kind of experiment and do different things and loki's always been a very interesting character he's a really cool anti-hero um, and seeing, you know, his arc in the films was so cool. And now this kind of is allowing us to go, since he was restarting him where he was at Avengers, getting him to go on a, a different arc. Um, and maybe some parallels to the arc he went on in the movies, but there's some differences. And just, you know, does a lot of cool stuff with identity. And 
and Owen Wilson is all in the MCU is just great. Now we're going to get Ki Hu Khan in the MCU. So, yeah, stoked for this one. Yep. Can't wait. Can't wait. So that was our mm-hmm. top 10 stuff, uh, top 10 nerdy stuff we've been looking forward to for this year. Very quickly going through some uh, honorable mentions. I wasn't sure if Knock of the Cabin was a nerdy thing or well, a... I think we're forgetting yeah. something. Oh, Damien. you're number one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're number one. So, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Like, my, ah, apolo- we're my apologies. We're my apologies. Yep. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. I'm kind of amazed that that you didn't have this on your list. Um, uh, um, I don't know, maybe because uh, the last one wasn't great, but um, you know the odd the odd ones are really are really good in this series. The evil ones are a little bit of a step down, but the odd ones Star are Trek? always uh, no 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 that you got it backwards. The tre- the uh, that the uh, even ones are good in Trek, oh. but in in this series one one and three two of the greatest movies of all time. Two and four, kind of weird, but I still have a soft spot for them. Even Final though Destination. Fucking hate four. Uh, yeah, this is this is Indiana Jones <laughs> and the Dial of Destiny. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, I. What did you think it was? Final did, Destination. You know what was this? Final Destination oh, no, Six no, or no. something. I, yeah. No, Final Destination movies are all fucking trash. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, I I I do I do goddamn love the indie movies. Like like I said. Um, Raiders and Last Crusade, I think, are absolute perfect films. Um, you know, I'm I, this is going to be John Williams' last movie that he ever scores. Uh, there's some, you know, it, it seems like they're, you know, by the time uh, Spielberg got to four, it felt like he just this was a character he felt obligated to keep making movies about, but it, you could tell his heart wasn't really in it. So I'm, that's why I'm really glad that James Mangold is going to be taking over. The helm here, the guy who directed Logan, like getting to do an Indiana Jones movie, that just sounds rad. There's going to be some cool flashback stuff. There's going to be some cool aging stuff. And to kind of just see the culmination of this story, like, you know, this is going to be, you know, three was maybe supposed to be the end for Indy. Four was maybe supposed to be the end for Indy. But this is definitely going to be the end for Indy. And to see how this story ends, this is maybe my favorite film character ever. So there's no way this wasn't going to be number one. And Harrison Ford is always having the time of his life playing Indiana Jones. Like, he, he's an icon, you know? The hat, yeah. the whip, you know? It, it's so good. Saul is coming back. Like, there's so... There's, mm, I'm so fucking excited for this. <laughs> I mean, it could be bad. It could be a letdown yeah. like number four was. But come on. It's it's going to be good. It's going to be fucking great. It's Indiana Jones. I, let's go. Let's go. Let's get hyped. Yeah. I have hope for you. I'm giving I'm emanating I'm 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 emitting hope for you. I'm generating hope for you from my face hole right now. <laughs> I really hope it's I, know, I do. Oh I, hope, I hope it's good. Um my worry is, do you remember you've seen um The Irishman, correct? I have, yeah. Yeah, so that scene where, you know, it's supposed to be young Robert De Niro like 27, 28 year old quote unquote Robert De Niro, but played by 90 year old Robert De Niro coming out, trying to cur- curb stomp that guy. And it just looks like an old man trying to curb stomp a, a young, young buck. Oof. Not great. Oh yeah. No, that's, that's, that, well, that's not great. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I was not a fan of the Irishman in general. Uh, okay. so like yeah. there was, there was a lot more of the, the Irishman <laughs> that, that bugged me. So yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens with this one. Uh, yeah. you know, I don't think it's going to be too heavy on the, the uh, flashback stuff, but you know, yeah. I, I, uh, Industrial Light Magic, pretty good at special effects. So you know, I don't think that they use them for the Irishman. Um, so I, I think I got some faith in that ILM is going to do a good job with it. Yes, again, I gen- I generally hope it's good. Always want things to be good. Um, so that was our top ten uh, most anticipated things of the year. Qu- uh, quickly go through our honorable mentions. I read. The book that Knock the Cabin was based on, called The Cabin at the End of the World by Paul Trumbly. I liked some of his stuff before that he's done. Uh, he, he has one. It's a very interesting um, possession book called uh, A Head Full of Ghosts. I would recommend anybody that likes really good, really interesting um, horror. Definitely check that out. Uh, Knock at the Cabin is directed by uh, M. Night Shyamalan. So this is his follow-up to Old. So hopefully... <laughs> it's a bit better than that. That one was. Um, we got some really interesting actors in here. Dave Batista, Jonathan Groff, Ben Aldridge, um, Rupert Grint is in this as well. Um, so this is based, it's uh, not to go into too, too many details, but it is a, a home invasion story that goes awry. So um, how about you? 
I mean, yeah, a lot of the, my honorable mentions are the ones that were on your list that we talked about a little bit. And then, of course, the ones you had just said. Um, I'm excited for Invincible Season 2. Uh, yeah. I really, really enjoyed uh, the first season of Invincible, the Mario <laughs> movie. Uh, uh. I'm excited for it. it <laughs> Like I mean, well, not excited. That's not the right <laughs> word, but I, I like Mario. So um, curious, you know, I was like, curious like to see what that's going to yeah, be. Yeah, exactly. It could be good. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's you know, yeah. it, I, it's it's going to be different. At least it will probably be better than the last Mario Brothers movie. Yes, uh, Mario it's the fungus. You know, <laughs> Luigi the fungus. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, they're making an Exorcist prequel again, so it might be I heard good. it's going to be a sequel. Um, I heard it's going to be a sequel. direct Sorry, sequel. Yeah, sequel, yeah. sequel. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the new Pixar movie, Elemental, should be pretty cool. Uh, I do love Pixar, especially yeah. when they're like getting weird and like, oh, what if, uh, what if emotions? And this one, they're like, or what are feelings? And this one's like, what if emotions? And you're like, yeah, okay, let's see that. <laughs> and then, uh, and then you got a uh, Renfield, which is you know the. Story yeah. where Nicholas Holt plays uh, Renfield, the titular Renfield, and uh, you've got uh, Dracula played by Nicholas Cage, and you're yep. like this looks fucking rad as shit, like Dra- Dra- Nick Cage playing Dracula, like, and and Nicholas Holt is an actor who I'm all, I'm very interested by. I think he's really brilliant, and the two of them, I'm I'm so excited to see their dynamic. I'm sure it's gonna be great. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, excited for that, but um, even more excited for the other Nicholas Holt vampire movie, the Nosferatu uh, re- remake by Robert. Oh Eggers. yeah, yeah, forgot yeah. about that. Robert yeah. Robert Eggers. is that 2023? I I, did, I don't even know the release date. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't seen an update on that. They say maybe maybe late this year, maybe early next year. Yeah. Um, is Mando coming out this year? Season yes. three. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mandalorian season right, three. Mando should is, be good, even though yeah. they undid the fucking character growth that and the great ending of season two in goddamn book of boba fett so i'm just like okay whatever yeah like you saw boba fett right no nope no oh you should watch it because you won't understand what the fuck is going we should watch like (laughs) from like episode five to seven because it will mando season three will make no sense if you don't watch it all right will do um and then yeah just uh, x-men 97 uh, rebooting that uh, great uh, show from the 90s. Can't wait for that. Uh, we got the Marvels, you know, another uh, MCU mm-hmm. project. So I've got to... Uh, got to see that to be complete, be be a completist. Um, got Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. I guess is a movie that that will be coming out in theaters this year. Um, Shazam: Fear of the Gods uh, should be should be a thing that's coming out. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to feel about these things that are just like yeah they're they're coming out, but then you know. Um, Ch- Are they? Gun. Like, yeah. like DC, the way DC right. has been operating, they're like, we, we don't, well, you may, maybe we'll make a whole movie and then we'll just throw it in the trash. The only movie <laughs> we're going to make is the one with the person who's going around and choking all of Hawaii. That one is for yeah. sure coming out. Who knows about the rest? Right, right. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, that's about it. Anything else here you want to mention before we move on? Uh, no. I mean, there's no? some big ones that yeah. we haven't mentioned like Fast X, I've never seen a Fast and the Furious movie, and I don't give a shit about them. But you've never like seen any that. Fast and the Furious no, movies. I've never wow. I have no desire to see any of these fucking oh, all movies. Right. I've like, oh, family. I don't need to see The Rock not lose a fight to Vin Diesel one, because they both one through five they can't use a fight. One through five are fair. Are, are just great. One through Legitimate. five. Are you say, Are you saying that? You, you yes. No one in the world likes Fast and the Furious four. I'm not sure what that which one that that is. It's it's one sure. no, like that's that one's Fast and Furious. They all have the ass. same yes. title. Sure. It's just like no it's like Fast Furious. There's like they took out the does, it's cleaner. A team of bank robbers they're just like, Yeah, let's just take the whole safe, attach it to a to a grand dam and speed it down a ton a, speed it over a um a bridge. <laughs> just attach it maybe to, i'll watch tokyo to, drift to, you can yeah. maybe you can get me to watch that one yeah that's incredible actually that's i will not hear any disparaging remarks about tokyo drift i actually but. i don't even know how or why but i love han like i've never seen any yeah, of these movies right. but i've seen bits and pieces and i'm like this han guy like <laughs> yeah justice for him like yeah. why is deke shaw on the team he killed han what's happening <laughs> yeah all right, so that's yeah. That's oh, and that. then and then one more we yes. should mention: Evil Dead Rise. You know, it's Evil Dead out, Rise. So, yep, yep. Which I still is gotta see. like I don't. Yeah, it's like a weird mother daughter zombie movie, and you're like, yep. this is nothing to do with the Evil Dead, but sure. 
Yes, that, that I'll use that as a jump, uh, jumping off point to, to complain about uh, a thing right right here, real quick. Uh, Evil Dead, mm-hmm. Re- Evil Dead, the the remake uh, from 2013 is a is one of several movies I've found recently that are just not anywhere. Not, I have I have every streaming service. I'm like Thanos over here with all the streaming services. Like so many things I'm watching recently. Let me pull up my my watch list this year. Uh, what did I see? The Name of the Father is what we're talking about later. Not streaming. Kicking Screaming from Noah Baumbach. Not streaming. Slapshot I just watched. Not streaming. Evil Dead. Not streaming I anywhere. Up yeah, it was it was fine. Um, but just the it's you know a fucking so, great movie. So man. many oh of these God. movies are not streaming anywhere. I'm not I'm not destitute. I'm not I'm not a poor man. But like it's these all of these are, are killing me every. Yeah, well that's these... that's why I didn't not that's not the real reason. But that yeah. like you know I didn't watch Sex Lies and Videotape, which is my yeah. my letterbox assignment. Not streaming anywhere. Um, but it's not streaming anywhere. You know, it's crazy. It's nuts. And there's some there's some movies that like you literally can't even rent. Like no. I fucking the Baxter. A great movie, one that I've wanted to cover on Underrated for a while. Um, we ended up covering another uh, movie from um, those guys, uh, uh, the, the Michael Michael Showalter, um, instead because it's just you can't even fucking rent it. You can't buy the DVD. The movie essentially yeah. doesn't exist. Like, <laughs> is the and Baxter, that's a great movie, The Baxter? Is that a spinoff of Anchorman about uh, Anchorman's dog? No, it's it's about it's about. Um, it's it's the, like the you know the guy in the movie the nice guy he's usually played by oh, fuck what's his name Cyclops um yeah. and you know what I'm talking about what's his name yes he, he, yeah he's he's always he's the guy who's the nice guy but then there's the romantic lead and oh okay you, it's like Carrie Elwes in Liar Liar <laughs> there's a nice yeah. guy who's dating the rom- so you know that this guy's yeah. got to get screwed over that's right. a Baxter and this oh. keeps happening he's like you know he's it's a, he's at the prom and then. The, the prom king and queen get back together and because they've been getting a fight. So he's always that guy in the movie, but it's told from his point of view. Uh, gotcha. David Wayne it plays him, and it's really funny. <laughs> if you like Wet Hot American Summer at Absurdist yeah, Comedy, like it is so fucking good. Paul Rudd's in it. Michelle Williams is in it. And she's really oh, goddamn wow. good. She's huh. like the lo- the leading love interest. And uh, the, the other guy who's like the main, he would be the main character in any other movies, uh, Justin Thoreau, and he's just so just like, and Elizabeth Banks is the is the girl, and he's like, oh, he's like, oh, oh, God. it's it's. Mm, I fucking love that movie, and you'll never see it probably, <laughs> so because there's right. no way to watch it. Right, 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 exactly. All right, uh, so let's run in it. Sorry. <laughs> let's move on to what we've been watching this past couple of weeks um i have a couple of things here that i wanted to mention from the best of the year show this slipped through the cracks but i'll start with the big one uh the last of us uh debuted this past week on hbo max um obviously just talked about a little bit of it pedro pascal as joel bella ramsey as ellie uh merle dandry as marlene um, we got Gabriel Luna's Tommy and a, t- and a tour of his test. Um, have you played the Last of Us video game? So uh, I've played the prologue and I never went back to it. Um, I've been meaning to go back to it for a while, but like I got it as a gift like way long, like in 2015 or something from my girlfriend at the time. And then we broke up and then I was like really depressed and I was like, all right, I'm gonna guess I'm going to play this game. And then I played the prologue and it's the most depressing thing I've ever seen in my life. I was like, I'm not going to do this right now. And I just never picked it back up. So, <laughs> Yeah, I haven't played it either. Um, I know the general story. I know a little bit about um, how it ends, but so still should be interesting to watch. Um, I think it was, you know, it was shot very much like a video game um, cutscenes. Mm. Um, even though, you know, that's not, a, that's not a derogative, but, um, you know, if you play a lot of video games, you sort of get used to a sort of tone and a sort of rhythm that they have. Um, I think I wrote about this somewhere, uh, but they have this rhythm, which is basically like <clears throat> they need to have a break somewhere where you or the player can explicitly tell when the cutscene has ended and when the gameplay has begun. And I feel like there are mm-hmm. moments in the TV show where you're like, oh, this is where gameplay would be. There's a scene ah. where I won't get into so many spoilers, but there's a scene where they go where Joel and 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 um uh, Joel and Tess go into a building to try to get a car battery. <clears throat> and, it's, and they put on they have these backpacks on and they sort of have to cut break the lock of the door before they can get in there to the building and you're like oh, okay i can see this point where they go they go into the door and 
they're surveying the area and like, oh, this is where the the game, this is where the cutscene would end. This is where the gameplay would mm-hmm. would begin. It's one of those things. And also, they sort of go upstairs and there's like this fight going on, or not really a fight, but people are just like oh, groaning and moaning. And you're like, what happened? And then the person in the background is telling the exp- doing the exposition, telling him what's happening while Joel has the gun on. Um, well, he has the gun on Ellie, telling her to, to sit down and stay there and stuff like that. So it's just, you know, and there's this part where he's like deciding what to do. He's talking to talking to Tess and deciding what to do because they need to basically take Ellie with them because the Fireflies were going to take them with them, but they got attacked by this other group. So he's sort of in the foreground talking to Tess about uh, deciding what to do. And in the background, uh, what is the Firefly's name? Uh, Marlene. She's like stabbed or shot in the stomach, right? And so she's in the background be like, I'm bleeding here. Can you guys hurry it up? And I'm like, that's, that feels like that scene that, that feels like that <laughs> moment in a video game where we're like, hey, come on, yeah. hurry up. What are you doing? Make the decision. Yeah. I'm bleeding here. Quick. It's like, oh, <laughs> oof. That's kind of rough. But it's only, it's one of those things that I think you only pick up on if you play video games. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, other than that, really good acting, really good. It feels like it feels like you're in the world. Um, I would highly recommend watching this to anybody that's listening or on the fence about it. I mean, yeah, I need I need to check it out. I just like I said, yeah. no time yeah. this month or this week. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Like all my what I've been watching are like things that we because we haven't just since we did we missed those episodes and then uh, we we you know took a week off and then we did the live show or the the best of show. Yeah. So a lot of these are just ones that uh are like best of ones that I was watching that just, we haven't talked about yet. We didn't talk about on the best of. So yeah. Yeah. From the past couple of weeks. And then, um, because of the last of us was done by Craig Mason and I had, uh, had a night free, um, after that, uh, you know, uh, HBO popped up as the, Hey, like the last of us, you should check out Chernobyl. I was like, I, you're right. HBO max. I should check out yeah. Chernobyl. So I, I put that on, uh, completely binge the entire thing in one night. I mean, it's, it's only five episodes, so it's, you know, it's very much more bingeable than other things. Um, this is crazy. This is crazy for a couple of reasons. Um, cause it's so, we talk about things a lot on the show about being prescient, about being relevant to now. Uh, I think Chernobyl coming out in 2019, like six months before the pandemic was extremely prescient uh, about, yeah. you know, beer, beer, beer crap and uh, totalitarian and authoritarian governments um, looking at a problem, being looking at a major problem happening right in front of their faces and be like, no, this isn't a problem. This isn't happening. <laughs> that thing that you think is happening, no, it's actually not happening. Yeah. Oh, it actually is a big problem? Well, it's your fault. Um, it's just about them, you know, shutting down information, shutting down things getting out into the world and being like, we can't look like assholes in front of the world. So instead of uh, instead of facing this problem head on, we're just going to ignore it and try to do it ourselves and stuff. And so it's very much pressuring it about, you know, the U- U- the U.S.'s uh, reaction to COVID is very much of that. But it's all, you can also point to a lot of different countries' reaction to COVID wasn't great. Um, and and it's also pressuring just based on the fact that it takes place, you know, in U- U- Ukraine. So you see a lot of like, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. man, they're just... They, kicked in the balls over and over again. Ukraine has and Chernobyl has and Kiev has been kicked in the balls for the last, you know, 40, 50 years. If you even going back to, you know, World War One, World War Two, you could go, you know, that's a hundred years of, you know, mm-hmm. the uh, Eastern, Eastern Europe and Ukraine and those, that region of the world just getting fucking fucked <laughs> over and over again. So uh, incredible show. I think, you know, people have talked about this over and over again. Um, I think, I'm wondering if uh, the watch Andy Andy Greenwald and uh, Chris Ryan had the same thought, had the same sort of motivation to watch this because apparently they hadn't watched this as well. So they were talking about watching this for the first time on there. It's like, oh, oh boy, get to listen to their reaction as well. Um, so yeah, just just they said the same thing I will, which is just you know incredible acting, incredible uh, cinematography. Um, just it's the first episode will 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 grab you and um, reel you in. The explosion happens, and within ten minutes, you know the fire department's there, and it's like okay, just a fire. Yeah, it's fine. It's just a fire. We'll, yeah. we'll 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 pull up here with no with no PPE, no protection whatsoever from the radiation, and they're and they got the hoses out, and one guy looks down and he sees this piece oh of debris, God. and he picks up the piece of debris and he burns his hand. He's like, why is this hot? It was a fucking core it was part of the core of the the graphite yeah graphite yeah i was like oh my fucking god some of the best and most disgusting and most realistic 
uh, makeup. I don't know if this won any like <laughs> uh, technical awards at any uh, Emmys uh, the, the the next year, but some of the most disgusting looking. Um, you know, makeup of yeah. people that they people had just fucking melting essentially. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Again, people talk about this, but highly, highly, highly recommend uh, watching Chern- Chernobyl. Yep, I goddamn love Chernobyl. It's one of my favorite miniseries ever. Like, it's yeah. it's honestly the main reason I want to watch The Last of Us because I I was so blown away by Chernobyl. It's something I, I talked about on um I did an episode of it on. Uh, uh, gateway episodes um where i talk oh, yeah, about yeah, it at yeah. length and yeah yeah god dude, it's such a such a fucking good show <laughs> yeah and it's it's one of those things where it's like it's 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 capital it happened for uh for multiple reasons right but m- one of the main reasons was it's capitalism pushing from both sides it's pu- it's capitalism pushing from the let's keep production up let's keep our quotas up mm-hmm. it's the end of the month we have to do the test and we have to keep production up because they said so um from the end from the other side it's the cost cutting measure of we're going to put graphite in the uh in the rods at the bottom of the rods and that's going to cause uh basically that was one of one of the big parts of the why it exploded was they had graphite tipped mm-hmm. uh rods in there which they weren't supposed to do so it is just you know you look at you look you can you can blame a lot of different mechanics a lot of different you know governmental uh lack of response and lack of oversight and having a t- fucking 25 year old kid doing the task that never n- done it before yeah. but there's a bunch of different reasons that led to the explosion but it's also at the end of the day a lot of the, so much of human suffering and so much of you know destruction and atrocities that happen today can be traced directly back to is it cheap <laughs> let's just save a yeah. bunch of money and just do the thing do the test no matter if we don't know what we're doing to get more production and also let's build this thing as cheaply as possible so yeah yeah and it just it's absolutely terrifying that like humanity has the power to if they make a, they fuck up like this we could just kill millions of people it's just yeah. like it, it's it's fucking it's like so terrible and especially since i grew up um if anybody uh knows southern california i grew up uh in a city san clemente uh right next to a nu- uh, nuclear power station uh in san onofre um if you're driving down the five uh they're the tits that are there in the middle of the road uh, so those were right, right by my house. And yeah, so it's just terrifying to think about. Yeah, it really is. Um, so let's move on. Uh, some stuff I've watched that I want to talk about. Um, pretty much like in between the holiday season that I didn't get to, to bring up. Uh, the Wonders on Netflix. Um, one of the best. Uh, they, they, they've put out a bunch of stuff on Netflix at the end of the year. They put out Matilda. They put out um, White Noise. And they also put out The Wonder, uh, directed by Sebastian Lilio, starring uh, Florence Pugh. Uh, it's basically about a woman has to go to, it's like a small town, small English town in the uh, late 1800s, I believe. And she has to go there and sort of observe this girl who supposedly hasn't eaten for like three months. Um, and it is very interesting. I, I, when I reviewed it on the uh, my letterbox, I said, you know, it's, it's a interesting examination of telling stories and how if you sort of uh, examine the story too closely, then you sort of break the magic of the story. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's very, very good. Great performance by uh, Florence Pugh. Uh, I recommend just checking that out. Um, also checked out Matilda the Musical, which was um, I saw a bunch of you know posts on TikTok and Reddit and Instagram about some of these dance scenes. I was like, holy shit, that's incredible! Some of these uh, choreographed choreographed uh, movements that all these kids are doing at once, and it, and it is incredible. That scene that they posted is incredible, but it sort of gets diluted a little bit by the time you get there because every scene is choreographed that way, and every every scene has everybody sort of dancing in sync. Um, to the music, really great music, really great cinematography. Uh, definitely, highly, I recommend watching this on Netflix if you haven't. Okay, I'll have to check it out. Yep, and then uh, Fire Love, great documentary. One of the probably going to be one of the documentaries uh, nominated for best Docu- best documentary at the Academy Awards this year. Um, based on, uh, I feel like it's, it's very much a Werner Herzog. I think Werner Her- Her- Herzog did his own he, version he of this. Did, yeah, he did one on the same the same people um, yeah. a couple of years back. He yeah, did a lot of the same footage I was on like, the, um, the Krauses. Yeah, I was like, this is uh, this is Grizzly Man. This is people <laughs> examining. Honestly, a, a, you know what? It felt to me, it felt yeah. to me like a Wes Anderson, like if Wes Anderson was making right. a documentary. You know, that's, yeah. that's the vibes I got. Like this, this I loved this movie. Yeah. It was it was almost a mind 
on my top 10 of the year. I, I really went back and forth a lot, and I, I almost put it on. But yeah, this is this is a great fucking documentary. It is, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, like I said, um, Vernon Herzog did one called Grizzly Man, which is about a guy, you know, camping out in a national forest to study the grizzlies there. And he got uh, killed by one eventually because he stayed for too long one season. Um, this is also a similar thing where they're sort of getting up too close to one. And some of the shots you see of them are just like, dude, you are... <laughs> You see, the some of the shots are incredible because it's like, you know, this one person just sitting there in front of a active, exploding volcano. It's just like, how are you, how did you survive for decades of doing this? It's just it's some of the most incredible footage you've ever seen of somebody standing in front of a volcano. Really, really incredible stuff. Um, so then what else we got? All Quiet on the Western Front is something we both saw. Um, mm-hmm. It was talked about uh, this week on uh, The Big Pick, talking about um, some of the best uh, war movies of all time. And I think not not all time, but you know they did like top five war movies. Um, this is pretty incredible. It's just the sort of context they give you for how this movie starts. Um, it's obviously based on the novel and based, it's a remake that they've done, remade several times over the years. Uh, the scene a lot of people are pointing out is near the beginning where you have a guy in the trenches. Um, they tell him, you know, go forward, go forward in battle, blah, blah, blah. So then you see him sort of stab a guy with like a hatchet and then he gets taken out and then smash cut to somebody else uh, being assigned that same jacket. And the kid goes, hey, somebody else's name is in here. Like, oh, sorry about that. And they just rip it off and throw it on the floor. It's just like, yep, that's that's war in a nutshell. Just just yeah, just a meat grinder. Yeah. Did you like this? Uh, it was good, but it was like it was fucking depressing, man. This rough, is like one of the most. Watch. This is like this is the roughest watch since Grave of the Fireflies for me. Like this oh, is wow. this is <laughs> difficult to watch. Like, and I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, there's, I think it this the it really hit a point. Um, there's some horrific shit in this. Yeah. I think the the point where he's in the he stabs the guy and the guy is just like slowly dying and he's like shut up shut up and it just there's that it's that long extended scene of him dying and then he tries to save him and he's just still choking on his own blood and it's it's heart rending like everything after that was like was was good but i was like it it never i was like the rest of this movie is just redundant like that that scene said like i could have just watched that scene and that said everything that the rest of the three hour movie could have said um but yeah, it 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 was it was good. Um, not not great. Not one of my favorites. I think it didn't make my list of top movies or honorable mentions. Um, but yeah, it, it, you do feel powerful. It does feel powerful. Um, you're also like, oh shit, that's Daniel Brühl. I guess it's yeah. a German movie. They got to cast <laughs> yeah, Daniel Brühl. Of course, of um, course. But yeah, it is very depressing, and it's just like, man, fucking like it's just like. It's like these fucking like it's like that last scene just made me so angry. Like yeah. that where he, they just are like just go into battle and blah blah blah. And I, I get that's what they were trying to do, and it fucking works because I was so pissed. I was so <laughs> mad at the end of this movie. Yep. So it definitely worked on that level. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the last thing I'll talk about real quick is the uh, kicking and screaming. Uh, one of the Noah Baumbach's uh, first movie I've seen. Oh, not much... not the Will Ferrell soccer movie. Not the not the Will Ferrell soccer movie. Not, nope. not Mike Ditka and Will Ferrell. <laughs> is that Mike Ditka and Will Ferrell and who else is in that thing? Um, uh, no one knows. It's been no forgotten one knows. the same yeah. time. <laughs> uh, this is fine. This is uh, this is a lot of things that I'm sort of like thinking about when I think about like you know. Uh, acad- academia. I think Noah, Bog- Noah Baumbach thinks about this stuff a lot, especially with um, his newest one with the uh, white noise. I think this is, you could definitely trace back to a lot of the stuff he's been talking about a lot of his throughout his career. Trace back the trace back all of this stuff to this movie. It's basically about you know four four friends have just graduated college and like, well, uh, what the fuck now? Uh, it's it's a, it's a decent version of one of those. I always do enjoy seeing uh, Parker Posey pop up in things. I've always, I always had a crush on her since I've seen her <laughs> in uh, um, Dazed and Confused way back in the day. Uh, let's see. Noah Baumbach is, uh, has a cameo in this. Um, Eric Stolch is in this. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a it's one of those you know '90s sort of na- naval gazy um, you know Austin. I don't think it was filmed in Austin, but it very much feels like one of those. Uh, Who's the other guy that does the uh, came out of that came out of the '90s movement? Um, Robert Rodriguez. Uh, no, the other one that he's does. In Austin. The, he is in Austin. Oh, um, oh uh, uh, he's bald. Um, 
he the guy you the movies where people whisper. A... <laughs> the guy you said you didn't like very much that does the um after oh some, no after that's sunset. his protege okay uh, i was thinking yeah there's um uh because it's uh, <laughs> uh <laughs> Uh, oh my god, why what am I name? forgetting everyone's name who's ever Link, lived? Linklater, yeah. Rod, Richard Link. Yeah, Richard Linklater. Um, it feels like something uh, that he would make. Yeah, yeah I, I don't like Linklater. Um, who is his mentor? Who was I thinking of? It's Terry something. I'm not right? sure. The ball he does all the movies where people are whispering. The, the Brave New World and, oh. and uh, The Thin Red Line. Oh, that's his mentor? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Thin Red Line guy, yeah. Let me see. Thin... I didn't know they Terrence uh, Malick. Terrence, Terrence Malick. Malick. Yeah, I didn't know they were buddies, huh? Yeah. They don't seem like um they don't seem like they would make the same type of movie. That's interesting. Never would have thought that them. I mean, I, it's I feel like some of some of uh the the, the I don't know. He he's yeah. a uh he's a lot less commercial Malick is, yeah. but I think if you watch his earlier films, you can definitely see the connection. Ah, interesting. Yeah, it was good. I'm glad I finally, you know, filled out uh, filled out his his filmography. So let's get to some stuff you've been watching. Uh, you watched the Pale Blue Eyes, just Pale the Blue Eye, not Pale Blue Eyes. Uh, yeah, just the Pale Blue Eye. Um, I believe. Uh, yes. yeah, it's uh, the Netflix uh, film Scott Cooper. I'm a big fan of. Uh, who he is. Uh, I really love his film. Um, Hostiles. Uh, which is also starring Christian Bale. And this is uh, a very, it's a murder mystery, uh, much like The Raven was, uh, that horrible John Cusack movie where it's a murder mystery where Edgar Allan Poe is there. Uh, except this <laughs> one is, you know, not, it, like Edgar Allan Poe just feels like it's set during his time at West Point, And uh, Christian Bale is investigating a series of very strange cult, like, uh, cult murders that are going on at West Point, and he kind of befriends a young Edgar Allan Poe, who is played by Harry Melling, aka Dur- Deadly Dursley, um, but he's skinny now, and he is just <laughs> he is just doing it. He's like, oh, hello there, ah, uh, yes, you see, uh, the the crime must have been committed by a poet because he stole a heart. Like he's doing like this weird, and then Gilly Anderson is also like, oh, I'm playing for the cheap seat. Like it's just like people are just so over the top. This movie, the like, Christian Bale is just doing his reserve, like. I'm a detective. I'm gonna solve this, and it's it's like it's it's a weird, weird, weird ass movie. And yeah. It's one of those movies where you're like, oh, the the movie, the the plot has been solved, but there's still 30 minutes left in this movie. What's going on? Um, there's, but I, I think it's like the plot is kind of whatever. Um, but I really dug all of the performances in it. Um, and it's a movie that just looks amazing. Like they shoot like all of this movie by candlelight. It just looks visually unlike really anything else I've seen. Um, you know, it's it's got that natural available lighting that you see in a few films, but even then, it's it's it feels very distinct. So I think from just an aesthetic standpoint, it's an interesting watch. It's not a great film, but I think it's worth a watch. And it's, you know, it's a January movie. Like it technically got right. a like a release <laughs> twenty twenty three for Oscar qualification or whatever. But it's it's you know like one of those movies that just like all right, we're just gonna put this out in January. And as as far as that rubric goes, it's pretty good. It's very cool. Um, they talked about this on the Slash Filmcast this week. Did you hear, listen to that one? Um, I did not catch this one yet, so I'm going to have to listen to that. Okay, I won't ruin it for you, but they talked about this movie in there. I'll just yeah. I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you caught up with Decision to Leave. This is actually, you're thinking of back on it. It's probably one of my favorite movies I saw last year. What did you think of it? I, I fucking love this movie. Yeah. Um, I watched it the day after we recorded our Best Of podcast. Yep. Um, because I had just gotten Mubi and I was waiting to see it with a friend. Uh, and yeah, I, I really dug this. This was um, on my own personal list. This um, made my number eight. Uh, I love how just weird and twisting and turny it was. And you're, you're never really sure what's going to happen. Even if you're someone who is very familiar with the tropes of, um, you know, kind of these thrillers and these detective stories, you don't really ever know what's going to happen next. And I, I appreciate that because that's, hard to do to me in a movie um so i was really grateful that this one did um it felt it feels very hitchcockian it yes. definitely feels like the closest thing to hitchcock since hitchcock um you know the ending i'm still thinking about like i'm still like oh my god i still don't even know i like i i really gotta rewatch it because i feel like i miss so much the way that it kind of tricks you by using film language and it doesn't really follow the rules that we've come to uh understand and accept 
through 130 or whatever, how long, ever long film has been around of film being a medium. It, it just kind of does these weird other things. It just does whatever it wants. And you're like, is this a love story or is this a murder story? Like, what genre is this? And it's kind of all of them. And it's funny and weird and sad all at the same time. And uh, yeah, it might even go up in my estimation when I rewatch it. But I really dug Decision to Leave. Nice, very cool. Um, let's see. So you saw Hustle. Um, I actually really, really like this. It's another one of those Netflix movies that I sort of went into thinking, okay, this is going to be like you know mid range three and a half, three star movie, but I ended up really like really liking it. Uh, what would you think of us? Yeah, I, I dug it a lot. Um, I think Sandler is great in this. I kind of hope that he is he is one of those uh, guys who is able to slip in with those last two best actor performances because I thought I thought he was phenomenal. Um, him and Queen Latif in this have this really wholesome relationship. Uh, this feels like it's not a it's it's a basketball movie in the same way that Moneyball is a Moneyball movie. Where yeah, there's there's some sports in it, but it's not really about that. It's about this person in the world of this. Um, at the same time, there is some basketball, which I do appreciate. Um, it's not like High Flying Bird, which is a movie that I was pretty disappointed with, where it's like a basketball movie where there's literally no. <laughs> uh, basketball in it. Yeah. Um, I, I really liked uh, the actor who plays the main basketball. He's actually in the NBA. Let me look up his name real fast because I thought he was from, like sometimes you know when you, oh it's like you have these movies like The Blind Side or whatever you're like okay we gotta we put an actor in it or we'll put an actual athlete in it so they can do this stuff um, and it's it's they're never crying. Like he was incre- like he's crying and shit like that. Um, Alright. Uh, his name is uh, yeah uh, uh, uh Juanco. Okay. Uh, yeah. So he plays on the Nuggets. Um, but yeah, he, he yeah. is so good. Like yeah. he is phenomenal. Like all the stuff with him and his daughter, and then his mom. Like I was like, the dude can act. Like if as soon as he's done in the NBA, he should just be an actor. You know? Right. Like wow. Like he's he's phenomenal. And and you know you you know that like Sandler like really cared about this movie because he's a big basketball guy. Like he's friends yes. with Shaq. Yep. Like, so you can tell that this was a movie that actually meant something to him that he really cared about and he wasn't doing a lip service. Um, yeah, Anthony Edwards is a really great villain in this too. Like, uh, who knew? Uh, but he was just such a dick. Uh, so yeah, I, I really had a, a fun time with this. One of the best sports movies I've seen in a minute. Let's see what else we got. Uh, weird. What is uh Weird. Weird, weird, the Al Yankovic story. Oh, this yes, yes, the, yes, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, this is the uh, uh, Weird Al biopic, and yeah, it's funny. It, it you know, it's it's very ridiculous and over the top and just gets weirder and more insane, and there's some pretty fun cameos. It's not as good as something as like Walk Hard, um, right. but it does do a really good job deconstructing the pretty tired tropes of the music biopic, and Danny Radcliffe is great in it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of biopics, you checked out Elvis. Oh, ho, ho. It's got, you know, it's yeah, got nothing to do awful. with us. Movie... <laughs> it has everything. It has everything to do with us. Tear it apart. Tear sucked. it apart. Go ahead. Go off, okay. King. Okay, I didn't hate Austin Butler, all right? <laughs> yeah. Austin Butler is fine. Yeah. He's, he's fine. I don't know what the fuck Tom Hanks is doing. Right. Tom Hanks, like, like, what in the world is he doing? Like, like, I don't know. Like, he's just been channeling the terminal for his last couple movies, and it's not. that's not a good thing. Um. Yeah, it's just it's a three-hour not, and I'm I'm someone who I think Baz Luhrmann, if he in the right capacity, is really good. I think Moulin Rouge is amazing, but man, like I hate music biopics. They are the same thing every single time, like beat for beat. Yeah. And this was just that, but done through Baz Luhrmann's psychopathic, just nonstop. Like I, I saw the, the, you know, Patrick Willems described this movie as the world's first three-hour trailer, and that's exactly how it feels. Like this movie yeah. is relentless. It is. It's shot so weird. Like, they like when they first meet. It's like shot like a romantic comedy. I just. It, it was. It was fucking weird, man. Like I. They, yeah, they did that thing where they're like. Yeah, they did that exact same thing where they're like, that white guy can sing like that. What? Yeah, they're like he, he's white. Like that's become like a meme on TikTok where it's yeah. just like he's white. Like it's, it's what? so. And it's like it tries to frame Elvis as like this like supporter of like like civil rights and it's like yeah. he had a really and it's like it glosses over the fact that he like like married a 14 year old like he completely glosses over it 
still, yeah, it's, it's like it's like oh, it's like oh, the pretty teenage daughter. I'm like, yeah, teenage, as in like not like eighteen. Like she's fourteen in this yeah. scene when he's, he's yep. meeting a twenty year old Elvis. You yep. neglected to mention that one, and like the way it portrays the colonel is just like everything about this movie is a mess. Like it, it looks interesting, but man, and like Austin Butler is good, but God, everything else about it is pretty bad. <laughs> yeah yeah not great um yeah. wendell and wild is something you checked out yeah. um, oh, we, know- we skipped yes. over one can we, we backtrack real fast sure. we skipped over 13 lives oh, 13 lives yes okay yeah go ahead yeah. sorry about that yeah um this is yeah this is the um the ron howard movie uh that came out this is one of the ones i was watching at the end of the year to see if it was going to make my list didn't quite make my list but this is the story about the thai soccer team that was trapped in the cave and yeah. um i do need to watch the documentary the rescue still um because it's about the same subject matter obviously but yeah this you have it's a really compelling story um obviously the real story is just so interesting and i think that's all of my favorite ron howard movies are movies about these great real life stories when he does things that are you know true or like not like just kind of made up or like star wars movies or whatever i'm just like fine whatever but when he's like Oh, Rush or like Apollo 13. It had a very, a very similar feel to like Apollo 13, which is like these people solving this problem and, and getting the, and they come to this hurdle and they come to this hurdle and they got to do this. And there's some like really brilliant sequences in this. Like when you first see the soccer team after not, because you, you start with them and then they go into the cave and you don't see them for like maybe 45 minutes. And then when you first see them again, you're like, oh my, well, you're like, fuck, it, there they are. Like they could have been dead like you know they're not dead because you know the history but you're like maybe they could have um uh Beagle mortensen phenomenal on this uh this is the year of um colin farrell he's really good in it gives a much different more stoic performance joel edgerton i'm always a fan of his um so yeah this is just if you like apollo 13 you like that kind of ron howard history movie then this is a solid one for sure nice yeah i um I always point to this story as being like, why is Elon Musk such a fucking piece of shit? Because didn't he like that's, say that's the moment? That's the yeah. moment when it turned, and we all fucking realized that's when it started. Well, most people, most most yeah. most normal people realized he was a piece of shit. But yeah. I, thought, said, I thought it was cool before that, and then I was the first. Yeah. This was the first indication. I was like, what? What'd you say? Because <laughs> then he and said then it was he, all downhill from there. He was gonna send like um like a submarine. He was gonna send like all these different fucking. Uh, high tech machinery over there. Then he called the guy that was actually there a pedophile, right? Yeah. Just, just, ugh. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> so <laughs> much, it would have been so much better just to just not open his mouth anymore. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like he's a pedophile because he wants to save children. Let me save yeah. the children. Wait, yeah. what? Yeah. That, wait, what did you just say <laughs> about saving children and what that makes you? And what do you want to do? Okay, never mind. Elon, just stop talking. Yeah. Um, next up, you watch Wendell and Wild. This is another Netflix original thing. Um, I'm like sort of mm-hmm. on the fence about this. I've heard so many uh, uh, variable of, of opinions on this. What do you what do you think of Wendell and Wild? Uh, I'm a really really big Henry Selleck fan. Um, I I've loved pretty much everything he's ever made. He's only this is only his fifth film, despite him having a career that stretches back to the early 90s. His first film that he directed was, of course, Tim Burton's A Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, which everyone thinks Tim Burton directed because... <laughs> yeah. It's called Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, but he also did James and the Giant Peach. Uh, Monkey Bone, which is a weird one, admittedly. It's it's not great. Uh, but then he also did Coraline, which is a masterpiece. And he hadn't done anything since 2009 because he's kind of an outsider. Um, and, you know, he doesn't always get funding, but Netflix gave him funding, and it was really... This is this is an interesting movie. It's him and Keen Peel, uh, who star and wrote it. Um, and yeah, it's if you've dug Henry Selleck in the past, you'll enjoy this one. Uh, it's not my favorite of his by a, a long stretch, but it does feel like he is trying to give um, something. I will commend him on is he's like definitely trying to tell different stories and give different voices to different people. Uh, this is a movie where I was just kind of amazed that this is a movie, and they never even comment on this where there is. Everyone in it is, there's no just able-bodied, straight white guys in this movie. Everyone is, uh, like, person of color, or, um, like, there's a main character who's trans, and it's just, like, not even a big deal. Uh, There's, the only white dude in it is wheelchair-bound. Like, it's honestly a phenomenal from that aspect. 
Um, and it's cool to see just this kind of animation that doesn't really exist. He's a master of the stop motion style. Getting to see this movie is really, really great. Um, you know, like I said, it's if you're gonna if this is your first Henry Selick, um, yeah. you should, should watch just just watch Coraline or <laughs> yeah. James and the Giant Peach or uh, um, you know Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, and then you can watch this, and then you can watch Monkey Bone. Uh, so <laughs> okay. Yeah, I liked nice. it though. I, I thought it was it was it's pretty rare. All right. So you recommend it? Yeah. Okay. Um but then let me uh let me go to the bathroom real quick. Uh why don't you tell us about uh while I'm there, uh tell us about Avatar because there's a couple three R movies that um probably not gonna watch. Uh Babylon being one of them and Avatar oh. two. Yeah, maybe not watching Babylon. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> Are you we'll gonna see. watch Avatar? I uh it's all completely based on your review. Uh, coming up right now. Okay. So tell me what you thought All of right. Avatar. Yeah. Uh, Avatar is, it's, I was not a big fan of the first Avatar. Um, the first Avatar wore on me a lot. Um, this one, I think, is a major improvement. Um, from a technical level, they're both um, super impressive. This one is also equally, if not more so, technically impressive. Um, but from a story level, I think this is an improvement uh, because while both of them have very simplistic stories, the first one is cliched to a point of almost agony for me. This one, instead of just having a cliched story, there's very little story there. It's almost just like we're just going to go and live in this world. And it reminds me kind of like uh, if James Cameron had decided to make a Terrence Malick movie. Because it is just like living in this world and ruminating for three hours in this beautiful kind of paradise. And then it ends with this James Cameron, very Titanic-like action sequence where we are just kind of like going through and just running and crazy things are happening. Um, And a big reason why I think that this movie is such an improvement from the first one for me is that he brought in a writing team. Uh, Rick Jaffer and Amanda Silver, who uh, wrote the Planet of the Apes trilogy, the new trilogy, which I am a huge fan of. And him having that writing team, and uh, the first one, which was just written by him, uh, I think really benefited him, not just on a story level, but also on like a dialogue level. There's people in the first Avatar don't feel like they are real people. They feel like they are just these cardboard cutouts that are just saying bad lines like they're pissing on us and calling it rain <laughs> which is one of the most aggravating lines i've ever heard in my life yeah. but this one like people are talking real uh the characters feel so much more realized and interesting in it there, there's a fucking whale in this that is right. one of my favorite characters like the the whale is my favorite character i'm just like i, I love the whale like i want to see a, just a movie about the whale he's so cool he's a badass he's popping guys arms off like yeah like i, I was i was it's a movie that I saw twice in theaters, um, and it's not one of my favorite movies, but it is incredibly rewatchable. Like, I would rather rewatch this movie than a lot of movies that I gave how much higher ratings to because it is just like, yeah, let's just go and chill in this world. Let's just chill out and enjoy this world a lot. Um, so from that standpoint, I, I really have to recommend it. I say see it okay. in a theater. See it on as big a yeah. screen as you can. Get the 3D glasses. Um, I don't know about the variable frame rate. Uh, I'm I'm not really down with that. But um, yeah, don't watch this movie on home on your little. If, don't watch this movie on a, your phone. Whatever you do, okay. like this is a movie that is okay. really like <laughs> the power of cinema. You know what I mean? Yes. Gotcha. So yeah, right. and seeing it in a theater too with like like people and stuff like that um, is is really cool because you're just kind of like all along on the same this the same ride. All right, so I guess I gotta check that out. No, I'll probably go tomorrow, have the weekend off, so I'll head over to my local theater and check that out, because it's still playing. I think it's made, like, $2 billion so far, right? Yeah, Something it's made like an that. insane amount yeah. of money, and, like, people people are like, oh, it's not making money. I was like, look at how every James Cameron movie is opened. Like, it's, it's this is what's going to happen, so, yeah. No, it's it's a, I'm, it's interesting. I'm, I'm going to be on a podcast tomorrow um, talking about it a little bit more, uh, so, uh, yeah, excited for that. Nice, very on cool. uh, the Films and Stuff podcast. So check out me on that one. Anybody who's listening uh, should be fun. All right. Nice. 
Um, then real quick, because I know we're going long, but I want to talk about some books I've been reading recently. Um, the House in the Pines is a book. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, it's a book that I uh, was recommended to me because it takes place in my hometown, Pittsfield, Mass. Um, mm. In the Pines. Um, first book that takes place here. There's been a few. There's one I read that was... You know, it had like a made up town, but it was basically like Central Mass, uh, which is pretty close to here. But this one specifically takes um, takes place in here. Let me see. House in the Pine. I just thought of you, Damien, because right before yes. this, I, I, I went to tra I had Trader Joe's cereal. It's a maple pecan cereal. And I was like, ah, <laughs> ah tastes like Damien's hometown. <laughs> so I was just out there in Vermont. And I was like, mm, yes, exactly. This yeah. Is, this is what it must be like every day for Damien. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, let's see. The House in the Pines are written by Anya Ana Reyes. Um, so it's one of those like uh, psychological thrillers. It's about a woman who lives in Boston. Um, seven years after she moved there, she sees a thing. She she sees a YouTube clip of her ex boyfriend and a woman in a in a cafe or in a diner, and the woman just kills over and dies. So she's like, "Oh shit, this is happening again." Blah blah blah. That's that sort of thing. So she goes back to her home her hometown to figure out what's going on try to figure out the mystery and just so happens that her hometown is Pittsfield. So it's, it's got like every landmark that you would know if you were from here, like every, every shop, every building, all the, all the street names are correct. Um, there's like, there's like one bar that she didn't use or like one bar that she made up that wasn't real, but it was the way she described it. You could tell what bar she was talking about. Um, and then <laughs> the other diner, the diner where the woman died in was made up, I'm assuming because <laughs> the actual diner didn't want her using that location for her death. Right. Um, yeah. Um, it was fine. I feel like it didn't need to be taking place in a real place. It didn't really use the, the places like history to, to, to her advantage at all. Um, she sort of just like, awkwardly inserts the history of the town like just a real quick um uh, sort of you know what's what happened here it was just ge was here since like the early 1900s and they pulled out in 87 and you know not only were they they hired like 15,000 out of 50,000 residents here so they basically you know employed a third of the town they also you know uh, deposited uh, tons and tons of PCBs in the river and in uh, Silver Lake, which <laughs> at the end, she's like, her, her the character and her mother are looking out at Silver Lake and it's like, you know, oh, I'm sorry to believe you. We'll get you help. We'll figure this out, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, yeah, it's just, you know, so oh, look at the ducks in the, on Silver Lake and the geese. They're, they're you know, um, floating on top of the lake. Maybe it's maybe it's coming back. Maybe we can swim there someday. Nope. No, you cannot. <laughs> you can. You can physically do it. Nobody's going to stop you from doing it. But uh, you'll probably come out, uh, you know, with a third leg if you if you do that. So <laughs> highly recommend not doing that. If you read this book and you think that's a thing you can do, don't do it. Um, but yeah, if it, this is a is it's, it's a town that's like you know it's coming back. The North North Street is better than it's ever, I've ever seen it growing up. Pretty much every shop, every store window on North Street was shuttered. There was nothing going on in North Street. Now we have a movie theater. I, I, if you, if you asked me when I was like fifteen or fourteen or fifteen, if there's gonna be a, a movie theater on North Street, I was like, no, no fucking way. So that's nice. Huh. That's, that's there. That's there. There's, there's, there's just more vibrancy on North Street. Um, every, everywhere else is a little sketchy. You know, it's one of those places where it's like, you know, <laughs> stay on North Street and just, you know, get in your car. Then that's about it. But. You know, the way I think of it is like, it's like a kick dog, you know, it's been abused by GE. It's been a, it's been, it's this weird, it's in the weird location. And it's also very much, um, it's the epitome of the, um, infrastructure system in the U S where we're situated in a place where if, if they just had a train going anywhere other than like Canada or New York city, it would be great because you could go to Albany. You could go to Albany in like an hour. You could go to Boston in like two hours. You could go to New York City in a few hours. But because we don't have you know high speed rail in this country or any sub substantial uh, infrastructure in this country, if you don't have a car, you're kind of fucked. And this is a great example of it because you're situated in this place where like oh, I would love to go to you know Albany and Schenectady and go to all these the great movie theaters and go to we have a, we have a decent art you know um, art 
situation going on here, but I would love to be able to, you know, take a train or take a tram or whatever, go down to Great Barrington, go back, go to the other places. Williamstown has a theater that I want to go to because they have other movies that aren't playing here. So it's just situated in this place where it's just like, if you don't have reliable transportation, you're very much stuck here. Um, but, and I think, I mean, yeah, bump, you're, t- you're talking to somebody who lives in Southern California with fucking yeah. traffic. like, like I, sh- I should be able to get to LA in 30 minutes and it takes yeah. me two and a half hours. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about the book, um, having her putting it here, I think she could have very well said something along the lines of, you know, the city is it's been abused. It's, it's very traumatic that things have happened here, but it's coming back just like the character. Just on a simple like allegory or simple parallel, just like that. Just throw a, throw a line in there like that, but she never does. So it's very weird to me that she would you know pick this one city out of anywhere else to to put it in. You know, it's it's. It's very strange that she did, she did that. Well, but, isn't uh, that wasn't that isn't that the, the last? I mean, I didn't read it, but that sounds like that last line is where like ah, oh, the lake is coming back. Maybe we're coming back. Is that not <laughs> what the point of that was? Yes, but the lake isn't coming back. Is the thing? It's still dying. <laughs> it's it's not. It's literally not swimmable. There's nothing growing there. It's it's full of PCBs. Mm-hmm. It's full of chemicals that you don't want anywhere on your skin. Mm-hmm. So she either didn't do her research very well or just didn't care that that wasn't accurate. But yeah, just just more of like a general, hey, this town had a thing. It had a personality. It had a business. It had a, it had a uh, industry here, right, that, that up, uprooted and took a lot of the business, took a lot of the economy out of it. But we are sort of sort of, sort of starting to come back uh, in spite of that. So, yeah, it's called In the mm-hmm. Pines. Um, it's it's a decent like three and a half, you know, out of five star mystery thriller, psychological thriller. It's like it's like Gone Girl. It's like the, the girl in the window, the girl on the train, the girl in the blah, 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 that sort of thing. If you're into that sort of thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, then the three body problem is probably my favorite sci fi series I've ever read. I'm rereading it because they have a live action series that is uh, being broadcast right now in China. But I think there are uh, certain YouTube channels that you can go on and find it there. Um, I don't know if have you you've, you've probably seen this working in a bookstore. You've, you've seen this on the shelves. Yeah, I've seen I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah, it is a uh, book that was written in 2008. It was only just uh, translated into English in 2014 to 2016. Um, it's a, it's an incredible piece of work. It's it's some of the most original and inventive sort of way of constructing a first contact story. Um, I think the uh, the aliens live in this in the star system, which is basically it's one planet and it has three circling um, bodies, celestial bodies, which are basically suns that are completely randomized and they'll either make the planet a million degrees or minus a million degrees. So they have their, the way they live is basically they, they de-moisturize and they, they go into like a puddle mode and then they come out of it when it's in, uh, when their planet is habitable again. And they have to sort of, they, they say to earth, they give them a game called the three body problem where they have to, they ask them to, to solve this riddle of like, you know, there's these three suns circling them and there's no discernible pattern. So they're like, hey, can you figure this out for us? And if you can, then we'll still help you. We'll help you out with technology and things like that. It's It's got some really, some of the most impressive like hard sci-fi, hard sci-fi in terms of, you know, the propulsion systems are accurate, how, how the earth would react to um, first contact things like this, um, very hard sci-fi in terms of you know how far would a um, how far away a, a celestial body could be before it gets to us. Um, hard sci-fi in the sense of how long it would take to build ships that were capable of interstellar travel. Uh, it's one of the best sci-fi books I've ever read. So the first book is only 300 pages, so that one's a pretty quick read. The rest of them are much longer, but cannot I cannot recommend these enough. Uh, three body problem. Definitely recommend. Okay. All right. Yep. Well, I'll have to check that out uh, whenever I finish Lord of the Rings. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, like we said before, um, the letterbox assignment was not uh, completable by you uh, because it's uh, yeah. one of the most unavailable things on the internet right now. Six lines of videotape was what uh, was assigned to you. Um, but I did check out my assignment in the name of the father. Um, it is a movie from, let's see, 1993, 1994, I believe, um, starring obviously Daniel um, Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, Pete Possewaite plays his father. It was based on 
the uh, con- coerced confession of an IRA bombing um, done by uh, Jerry, Gary Conlon, Conlon uh, back in like, I want to say late 70s, early 80s. Um, and it does, it, it pretty much exposes the same sort of stuff we always talk about on here and the same stuff we're very much aware of, of, of just police trying to get, uh, get an indictment as quickly as possible, even though the person didn't really confess to it, even though they had a guy in jail saying, I did this and they didn't. And I'll tell you why, why huh. I didn't. i tell you how I did it. They didn't care. They buried the information. And also they buried the information about them. They said they were out the night of the bombing and they talked to a homeless guy named, um, I forget if it was the guy's name was, but they they buried that information. And uh, Emma Emma Thompson's character, she's very good in this. One of her early roles, she plays the defense attorney, and she finds this this folder which the uh, prosecutors hid from the defense uh, from the defense and said that like literally there was a piece of paper on there that said don't show it to the def- to the defense. <laughs> it's just like if you are at a point where where you still have any faith in the judicial judicial system of you know Ireland or America or England or anywhere, just Stop. <laughs> At this point, just stop. <laughs> Come on now. Um, but yeah, incredible. It's very interesting seeing, you know, I, I was somebody that grew up, you know, watching uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, one of his first things. It was um, the Gangs of New York and his early 2000s stuff mm-hmm. and seeing him in this sort of, um, you know, prestigious, uh, the Lincoln and things like that, seeing him as as these sort of very stately mannered men. Um, you know, the, the Phantom Thread uh, was that as well. It's very interesting seeing him playing a young guy, playing a goofball jackass, um, stealing huh. stealing uh, metal metal shingling off off of roofs just to sell it. It's a very interesting, very different role. If you ever if you want to see Danny Day Lewis in his early days, uh, definitely check out In the Name of the Father. I think it's uh, rentable on Amazon right now. Okay. All right. Yeah. Dope. So let's do our next time uh, assignments, letterbox assignments. I will go to my watch list. I added a few different things, so it'll be interesting to see what I get now. Um, I will hit shuffle, and I got Judgment at Nuremberg. This is one that popped up on my uh, notification list as being available, so that's good that it <laughs> popped up now. <laughs> um, I think it's playing on Paramount, so I might have to get that service. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's a bummer. That is a bummer. Yeah. Nobody so, wants Paramount. Nobody does. I guess you watch <laughs> Top Gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll be checking out Judgment at Nuremberg. Do you know who uh, who is in this? Who has a who has interesting? I have no idea. This is uh, the so the lead actors are Spencer Tracy, Burt Lancaster, Marlene Diedrichs, but it's one of the last. Um, one of the last roles of Judy Garland. I could hire. She gives a very good performance in this. Okay, interesting. Yep. So I'll be checking that out. Uh, so you can head over to your watch list. Yeah, I've got it pulled up here. I'll hit shuffle. Uh, okay, uh, an, an education. Um, oh, Gary okay. Mulligan, yeah. 2009 film. Um, all right, yeah. I'm going to also try and watch Sex, Lies, and Video Tape next time. Uh, right, yeah. Oh, man, do I have to rent this one too? Oh. God damn it. All right. I might just do sex, lies, and videotapes. I might skip this one yeah. for now. I'm going to stick it yeah. with sex, lies, and videotapes. All right. All right. Sounds good. Uh, let's Maybe do... I'll do both. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I'll leave it a mystery. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Let's get to our plugs. Plug in my Medium blog. My big one that I of the end of the year, best of everything, but not movies, is up there. Best of, best of top 10 movies is still up there, so you can check that out. I do many reviews on my... Uh, letterbox B for Benedetta B underscore four underscore Benedetta at Letterbox Film Essayist on YouTube, Anchor.com to make make a podcast and all the interviews are still up there and I'll be I'm putting out some feelers for some new interviews so if you want to talk some movies or you're a author or you are a uh, podcaster or anything like that your content creator you want to come on and talk about how we make content these days there's a wild wild world where there's apparently layout thousands and thousands of layoffs happening right now which fucking sucks um so yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's shitty yes so uh yeah uh, contact at uh bicycle at gmail.com or can i say something podcast at gmail.com what you got to plug Derek? Yeah, uh, I got to unplug in my podcast, Underrated, uh, which is every uh, other week we talk about a film that is, uh, as you might guess, underrated. Uh, this week, um, so coming out today, you can listen, we talked about The Thief and the Cobbler, which uh, has one of the most interesting production histories 
ever. Uh, it was in production for uh, thirty something years. Uh, this it was Richard Williams to be masterpiece. Um, unfortunately, before he could complete the film or would complete the film, depending on who you ask, um, it was taken away from him and released a kind of shitty version, um, shoddy version. Uh, by Miramax um, and a completion bond company uh, and uh, just kind of talk about the uh, the how incredible the film was and and that we because we actually watched there is a version on YouTube you can watch called the recobbled cut that I really would recommend that anybody should check out um, so we talk about kind of that one specifically is what we reviewed and uh, yeah uh, really really fascinating film we got to dive into this week over on underrated cool um and then like i said before um look forward to the oscars reaction podcast mm-hmm. coming out mm-hmm. coming at you <laughs> next week yeah. probably put that that out uh, the day after so next friday come back for our initial reactions to all of the oscar nominations happening on tuesday yep uh, yep excited yes. for that yes yes all right so for can i say something i'm damien and i'm a derek I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.